Hello listeners, this is the first audiobook of my novel named Centripetal, which is the first book of my upcoming mystery thriller series. Now, an important copyright disclaimer before I begin. All rights of this audiobook are reserved by Rohit Shukla, which is me. No part of this audiobook shall be used, stored in a retrieval system reproduced or transmitted in any manner whatsoever without a written permission from me except in the case of brief quotations embodied in critical articles and reviews all the characters of this book are fictitious and any resemblance to real persons living or dead is purely coincidental i dedicate this book to lord shiva my everything om namah shivaya to my brother who always adores my stories to mummy and papa and to all of you lovers of love this audiobook contains four chapters chapter 1 inception chapter 2 interconnected blind spots chapter 3 suitors or hedonists and chapter 4 macrocosm replevin so let's begin this journey chapter 1 inception betsy bry's sleepwalk song is a play in a vintage radio cassette tape recorder placed on the back seat of a gray contessa car which has open posterns two obscure gasping figures are dragging a half unconscious one by his legs who is grumbling sluggishly on the mucky grassy path in between sal trees while a third one is trolling forth them holding a flashlight in one hand and puffing the last shots of a cigarette from the left one narrator aha perfect portrayal of an arcane an unconscious mechanism which enthralls societies and they adamantly follow it even now okay one disclaimer before i began everything i am about to utter next is completely related to the characters in my story so no matter how small it seems don't ignore it a bit or you will miss the fun of exploring something relatable but unique ah oh. earlier i used to think about why people are not able to move forward no matter how much they drag themselves well yeah no same was happening with my creations I have squandered around many publication doors but they didn't give a damn about my stuff after being introduced to world cinema I came to know that my stories are not even a speck of dust in front of that vast ocean they have nothing in them to contribute to this world and then I came to know the mechanism of success well in this second month of lockdown When there are no work for me to do, 
I thought maybe I should record this anecdote of my own. Ah, for time's sake. As you know, time is very costly. So why waste in sleeping? The third one throws the dying stub aside from his fingers, which falls inside a small pothole filled with mud water. As all of them have reached near a riverside under a huge tamarind tree, the one laying down on the soil is quivering unevenly. Narrator, which country or city is this? How do they look and what are they wearing? How their home decor and surroundings look or feel? Does it matter? Even though living in the same city for years, we don't recognize acquaintances of our past. Ha! Huh, even names can be deceptive nowadays. In this era of progressivism, when monomyth is going through an ego death, this tale starts somewhere in 1990 the year of salvation. And I will try my best to solder the memories and present to you as many details as I could. Here, I'll be able to tell you only what I have felt or told by. We must look at some of the world event of that year before we begin. Ah, yeah, here it is. Hmm, East and West Germany separated in the World War. Reunited after about 45 years, and Lithuania restored back its independence from Soviet Union after almost 50 plus years. Sir Nelson Mandela released after 27 years, and Namibia got independence after almost 70 years. Meanwhile, the prolonged Iraqi Kurdish conflict intensified on a non-leaving asset matter, leading Saddam's mules to invade Kuwait. And that bloody Gulf War between living ones begin in this year itself. And in our country, ah, nature annihilated thousands of humans and 100,000 animals, while humans rubbed out hundreds like them with numerous fatal means. Numerous funeral pyres were burned and graves dug. This land drank many widows' tears and children's blood that year. When that chariot journey in Ram's name had been carried out only to scrape old wounds for country's throne, and this wound went ahead and became such a canker which shook the foundation of our country. Well, even my Zorba, the Buddha, left earth the same year. When this year of salvation has reached its farewell moments now, our story is stuck somewhere in between palpable and illusory world. Now, in this misty palpable noon of the city, sound of school bell, ringing reverberates around for the period change. Ten-year-old Robert is still lost in thoughts, unable to forget those happenings of that deadly night. Was that real or just some nightmare? Here again, that idiot teacher arrived to torture his guts. But wait, we have to plaster this clamor for now and keep our focus towards those visuals which Robert is recalling inside his mind. Hey, not too fast. Sink slowly, okay? So we are in some jungle. Look, that's Robert standing behind a huge sal tree in this full moonlighted sky. Robert turned back for a moment to glance towards the direction from where the indistinct music of Bestie Meyer's sleepwalk song is coming out from a car parked nowhere near him and turned to the front hearing the loud screeching of a forest eagle owl which reverberates around the forest coming from that riverside 
tamarind tree. Whole wood is buzzing with the loud sound of cicadas. Narrator Cicadas, yeah, see, this tiny brown winged orthopteran is sitting just on that above tiny branch of this tree where Robert is standing. If we rip it from the back, we will find that they have two sets of wings, delicate hind wings and tough leathery forewings called tegmen that cover those hind wings when folded at rest. The male ones have special structures for producing sound that females lack. <laughs> yep, you are guessing it right. It's the male one responsible for that whole cacophony around your garden. And they do that for sex. Hey, don't you dare to say it cross. Every human single male does a hell lot of cross things than the married ones. Ah, I deviated your focus. My apologies. Look there, Robert is panting rapidly while glancing towards that riverside some distance away from his spot. His hands were trembling and it's justified. As you can see, a child is witnessing three suckers booting someone dastardly. Chaos fades away as a loud sound of duster smacked thrice upon a table reverberated around the class. Narrator Robert came out of his mind's invocation with us and stares towards that Osmanson who starts adjudicating. Hearing the sound of duster, Robert returns with a shock into the present moment and looked around the class. Teacher. So lads and ladies, we will read today about a different kind force. <coughs> Due to this force, Life on earth exists, and we all too. We call it centripetal. What we call it? Children. Centripetal! Teacher. And what is it? Whole class started discussing about the question, and Robert again got lost inside that forest night. Suddenly, the howling of jackal starts echoing around. One of those three took one big stone from the riverside and smashed the face of that grumbling guy, which was fluttering on the grass in front of those three and it dies in agony. Narrator Montage of memories break through as now. We are in a dark room with some rays coming from the street light inside while passing the window curtains which were flying slowly by the wind. A wind chime is jingling and producing some soft tones. Just below it, Robert, age 10, is sitting on the floor, staring at the front with his wide icy eyes <laughs> while giggling sinisterly and his hands are fully blood drenched. And Robert awoke. Okay, that's a bit confusing, right? But erratic. Life too works like that, in a bit erratic manner. We always ask questions to the unknown and fall prey to faith, only to find a cause in tomorrow. Okay, we now stand outside a PWD office, which has added 19 years to his and the city's development. On one of the boundary walls of that office, we see a movie poster of Inglorious Bastards. What a movie man. My all-time favorite. Hmm. All I can tell about this city is that it's located on a plateau area. Lush everywhere. With housing for the working class. And an old ignited locomotive factory. 
like much of the country. All cemented houses and railway quarters of this city have only wooden entrance and window doors. That's a tough reality for thriller writers of India because it's really hard to carry forward a thriller without glass windows. Hmm. As it happens around the world and in our country also, no one gives a shit about female consent in this city too. Still, Ma Durga Puja happens every year gracefully. Leaving all that aside, we can focus on those distant mountain range peaks which can be absorbed by any eye witnessing this city for the first time. With some floras, some barrens, some old inanimate mills and many young dreamers, this town is searching its place even now on that blazing world out there. Mangal, age 29, handed over some key to Yadav, age 45. Narrator, Yadav, a real crook, ha! Huh? You can find several fraturists like him in government offices. Shrouded fighter seekers, beanbag scongies, who always talk porno and mind only their own welfare. Yadav, Lekhak Sahib, you must have checked the seal before closing, ain't you? Narrator. Mangal nodded with yes. And he gestures him to go while smiling like a hairy twinkler. At the same time, Nikitan, age 29, is sitting with a bowed head and sad face while hugging his backpack inside a local train's stinky compartment which is about to halt in some minutes. People sitting around him were conversing with each other. First boy. Government is slaying our asses. Can't you guys see? Fuck opposition. They will also do the same shit. They just get our votes and fuck us up. Second boy. <laughs> Not only here, it's everyone's story. Round the globe. Have you ever glanced around? Instead of going according to law, reformative justice is mending the situation by creating a union between victim and abuser. Bollywood, which had a lot of potential, is turning into a soft porn industry. From where did this assholic lingo, her no is yes, came from? 70% of crimes against women happen because of this mentality. I mean, who the fuck said that art doesn't influence people? Ha! <laughs> but now it's a different scenario. Ya yeah, can't count on anyone, on anything these days. Gradually whole world is heading into elephant's ass. As the train reached the station and slows down, people hanging at the door started getting down and the ones on the platform start boarding inside, even before the train halts completely. After a moment, Nikitan came out on the city streets with his backpack on the shoulder and walks towards the auto stand, which is half a kilometer away from the station. The street outside is plastered with people. He wipes a teardrop coming out from his left eye as he wanders. Nikitan... Why? Why does this always happen in love? Narrator. We don't know, brother. Sorry. Maybe you can know, but I'm still contemplating this subject for years. Nevertheless, I sleep on it every night and it moves between my mind and me, as like physicists, who still argue upon the quantum consciousness, for either it's baloney or sapiens. Mangal came out of his IOW office gate with a handbag and saw the same Hida, a transgender dog, wagging his tail. He took out his six rotis from the handbag he was holding in his right hand and gave them to Hira. Hira took the rotis in his mouth 
puts them on the dew-drenched grass and started eating them one by one, while Mangal smiles and strokes his head. Mangal then started walking towards the wide road, filled with heavy and light vehicles. While rubbing his fingers together, he passed by a crowd-filled restaurant, which has a navy blue neon light billboard atop and front door with the name The Crayons. It's a foggy wintry night. The cool breeze flowing around him is turning his exhaled warm breath into smoke while he took out the cell from his red jacket's left pocket and saw the analog clock which is clicking at 20 hours 8 minutes. Mangal. What a wonderful life you got, pal. The idle time which I deserved. Chirag got that. This undesirable job of my fate, job of a security guard, came in compassion by the government after the demise of my father. That childhood dream of writing seems like a dream now. Nevertheless, my mind is still hoping for a miracle, a push to happen from something unknown. It might happen or not, who knows? Narrator Like we all do, after some pep talk with our mind, Mangal also delves into memories of the past after taking some steps into those murky roads. Two years passed, bearded Mangal, with a skinny body and dark circles round his eyes, came out of an auto rickshaw, which just stopped in front of an old railway quarter. He came out with a somber face as the auto rickshaw left forth. Mangal's gaze, standing in front of the streetlight pole, fell on an orange-colored ignited lorry, choked with the strewn luggage and wooden furniture, which after spewing dense black smoke passed by his side. He slowly goes inside the quarter premises. As soon as he entered inside that quarter, he looked towards Chirag, age 25, who was putting out a garland from a framed picture. Mangal. Chirag. Chirag turns back, his eyes filled with tears, and he ran towards Mangal and hugged him. Mangal strokes his hair while looking towards the wall-hanged framed picture of his mother while a second picture of someone was placed upside down on the floor. Narrator As they moved out, neighbors around were staring at them both as if they had just released from prison. People love to see things going haywire. That's why you must have seen many people standing seriously watching JCB excavation on the roadside. Well, their childhood was spent in this railway quarter and now those two are shifting to some apartment building with a heavy heart, which was purchased by their father during their early years by some lottery money. Alas, if that truly had happened, but that's what he had said earlier to his Dinarian child, Mangal, or that's what he remembers. Decades ago, ah, we humans believed that only we carry these emotions into this earth and we killed every other beings for our welfare, considering ourselves as a chosen consumer of land. Then, sensitivity delves into us and we started praying. I'll not go into any details upon who got this, but sure enough that it must have possessed everything which our body has now and yes, it must have had surely felt the lack of technology in that era that we have today with us. In my time, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technique which is coherent in emancipating genetic diseases, has evolved to treat numerous incurable 
congenital problems and even capable of creating embryos of our own choice. A minute change in DNA, either by us or by nature, can alter our whole identity. Yeah, must also know the fact that our astrosages of pre-Krishna era had always mentioned in each of their tractates that the environment around you affects your whole generation. Ah, and now researchers have discovered, after so many decades, of those treaties that environment around you can cause epigenetic changes by altering the way molecules bind to DNA or changing the structure of protein that DNA wraps around. Fasting which was and is prevalent in every ritual we have discovered to reduce cancer cells while done with chemotherapies. Still we say all these things pseudo and never bat an eye on the possibility of discovering the arcane signs we lost. Maybe this lost knowledge can shed some light on the mystery of abiogenesis in later years, only if we consider about it. Bearded Mangal looks at his cell as it's 17 hours 17 seconds clicking on its analog clock. He goes inside the PWD office premises while it's been closing and the in charge of that office is kicking his scooter while wearing a grey helmet. Jadav is closing inside wooden doors of that office. When he saw Mangal while closing the window of the second room of the office, which reveals the entry gate, Mangal goes near the in charge, age 52. In charge. <clears throat> yes. How may I help you? Mangal. Sir, I have an appointment here. With a beam, in charge stops kicking the scooter and stands it. In charge smiles. Great, mate. On what grounds? Sweeper or watchman? Do you have the order with you? Mangal stares towards Jadav, who is closing the front door of the office while clearing towards him. Mangal. Sir, watchman. Mangal took out the joining letter from his handbag and gave it to him. In charge. Okay, very good. So, Mangal Srivastav, it's closing time. And, well, hold on a second. Jadav, are you finished locking up? You got an entrant here. Jadav came near in charge and handed over some keys to him. Jadav. I see, sir. Here's the key. In charge. Bring me the attendance register. Jadav ran towards the small and stuffy guard's room, which is just beside the main gate of the office, and enters inside. Mangal beams a little, hearing a loud and momentary fart sound coming out from inside that guard's room then acts normal as he finds the in-charge staring towards him. In-charge. He is Yadav. He will help you in understanding your duties. Start from tonight. Tomorrow is your holiday. Later, come in the noontime, okay? Mangal. Holiday? Ah, oh, sir, tomorrow is Friday, so... In charge. <laughs> See, you guys have to do duty on Saturdays and Sundays too. That's why the roster shifts give you weekends in between Monday to Friday. Don't worry. You will gradually grasp it. Prat. Jadav came and handed over one register to the in charge while Mangal is looking towards the office corridors. That office has a small garden with some flowering plants and a flag hoisting platform. There is also a leaky tap besides that platform. 
On the southern corner of the yellow cemented boundary of that office, there is a yellow painted garage with two pillars and a wooden maroon bedstead placed aside the wall. An old and rusty iron bench is also there outside of that garage. Two hours had passed. Jadav is smacking the TV remote with his palm while sitting upon a white wooden chair placed beside the bedstead. Jadav then raises the TV volume. It is an Onida company's old model TV placed upon a big grey empty tar drum. He glares at Mangal who is standing and watching the TV. Chadi Jawani video song is playing upon it. Jadav You got posting in a very tranquil place. Socializing can be fruitful. Mangal nodded while continuously staring at the TV. Jadav Okay, you sit. I'll come after dinner. And don't forget to bring a bottle of Kingfisher tomorrow. Mangal nodded while he sits on the edge of the bedstead with a grimace. Jadav goes towards his cycle placed outside the garage near the boundary wall. He took the cycle and goes out of the office. Mangal glares towards Jadav as he took the remote and tries to switch off the TV. But it didn't work. Furiously, he smacks that remote thrice. Then that TV turns off. Rubbing his wet eyes with a deep breath, he goes out of the garage and starts walking slowly. Reaching the front door, he sat on the nearby stairs of the office building while sobbing and glared towards the star-studded sky. Mangal, why God with this fucking God thing? An MA qualified security guard? Is this what we call fate? Is this it all ends at? I was an aspiring writer then and now I'm sharing my privacy with a snarfer. Is this why you send me down here? First you snatched my parents in that fucking car accident and now suddenly Hira enters to the grills of the main gate inside the office premises and approaches Mangal, waving her tail. Wiping tears, he smiles seeing Hira and starts stroking its head softly. Mangal Hey there, none of yours, none of mine. Let me feed you something. Hira with a bark jumps onto his lap, wagging her tail, and Mangal stands up with a beam. Mangal I gotcha. They walked towards the garage while Mangal looked at the sky with a low smile. narrator. Most friendly being. It never expects too much from us. Well, Mangal came back to the present moment where he is heading somewhere. Ah yeah, now I remember from that dilapidated street he is heading towards his home area's cop shop. All right. With a deep breath, Mangal went inside the police station of his area. Walking slowly through the noisy premises filled with civil dressed police officials, he stands near the door of a file soaked chamber. There he saw Jayant, age 30, standing while arguing with an old inspector who was also not wearing his duty raiment. There was no one else inside that chamber except the two of them. Jayant angrily, Sir, now, if you people are not going to help, then where do I go? Old inspector angrily. Yeah, right. I think I would call the constables and throw you inside that weed-wrenched lockup. What do you say, huh? Jant frustrated. 
What are you talking about, sir? Yeah, right. What do I say now, sir? It's my fault. Right, sir. It is not my fault. Old inspector angrily. So was that my mistake? Ah, fucker. You gave your money to that cheater like an asshole. And now rubbing your dick here? Even a five-year-old nipper knows that. Money can't give you a government job. What evidence is there that that pussy had taken your money? Giant angrily. We have exchanged several calls over the cell. You can search through the call records. And I also have the fake government form with me. <coughs> and also I got the details of that fake website of that cunt. Old inspector, get the fuck out of here. Or I'll beat the pulse out of your mouth, motherfucker. The old inspector glared at Mangal, who was watching it all standing some distance away from them, near the chamber's door. Inspector gestures him to come inside the chamber. Mangal noticed the teary eyes of Jant staring towards him while he entered inside. Jant left the chamber angrily. Mangal goes near to that inspector's desk. Mangal. Sir, I am Mangal Srivastav. I got called for the police verification. Old inspector. Oh yes, my boy. Have you brought that package? About which I told you over the call. Mangal took out two envelopes from his handbag and handed them over to him. Old inspector. I'm better late than never. Had there been one more day, your name would have been blacklisted. Fine. You may leave, son. With the grimace, Mangal leaves the chamber and came out of that police station. As he stepped forward, he saw Jayanth crying under a tamarind tree while constantly wiping his tears, holding his bicycle. Mangal turns his face towards the path and walks forth staring towards the cloudy sky. Mangal sighs deeply. Hmm. Sometimes I think that if I would just disappear like that, Mr. India, I would have been able to help many beings. Mangal again gets lost in some past thoughts. First flash. He is nine years old. In a day covered with a blanket of mist, some boys of his age are holding him and forcefully pressing him on the wet, muddy ground. He is screaming and crying while looking at some boys who are forcibly drowning a screeching puppy inside a water-filled dirty pit. Second flash. On that same afternoon, Mangal is standing with bowed head and scratched knees and knuckles while all his clothes were dirty and tattered. Some woman is screaming at some distance, away from him, holding the hand of a boy of Mangal's age with a bloodied face, whose shirt was completely torn and blood was oozing from his nose and brutally wounded right ear. And a man is talking loudly with his father outside his railway quarters garden. Man. Srivastav ji, control your son. For a fucking puppy, my son has been beaten like an animal. This time, I'm just warning you people. His memories fades away after hearing some indistinct sound of a scuffle happening, which are getting clearer while he reached his home streets. Two drunkards with torn, dusty clothes were fighting and hurling vulgar abuses at each other, while other people around them 
were watching them while laughing and scrutinizing their mishap. Mangal surpasses the crowd. Some steps ahead, two street dogs were also fighting with each other and barking aloud, while some other street dogs were also barking and hustling around them. Mangal. A mundane shit. Bunch of chintzy funkers watching two boobies fondling each other. Get to learn new abuses every day. I have to accept these people for now until Chirag gets settled. Mangal closes the door after coming inside his flat. Chirag, 27, is playing some game over his desktop wearing his white headphones while fluttering the joystick unevenly. Kiercing his hair, Mangal passes from his behind and starts washing his hands in a sink near the back windows. Mangal. Hey, Pachinko, is something to eat here? Chirag. Yeps. Some fritters and bread pieces. Mangal. You and your rat hole, have you eaten? Chirag nodded in yes with a smile while playing his game. Mangal goes inside the kitchen and took out from the black refrigerator some roasted pieces of bread with fritters on a plate and goes towards the second room. He starts the PC while putting the plate on the desk after taking one bread in his mouth. After sitting on the nearby white wooden chair, he opens up a docs file named The Mystery of the Edward Forest. The file has this heading, The Mystery of Edward Forest by Mangal Srivastava. Mangal looked at the first line of the first paragraph. Everything happens in this world for a reason. He then scrolls to the last paragraph. He starts typing continuously and his mind gets swayed into thoughts. Mangal, typing. Maybe something has happened. Robert, quietly, was sitting alone in the school playground. On a misty day around, filled with the cold breeze, tightly holding the sleeves of his navy blue sweater, Robert is sitting alone on the last side of the playground with a sad face and scared eyes under a huge tamarind tree, staring around nervously. Mangal, he had a dream where three people killed someone. He saw some glimpses of that dream and he got up and started running. Suddenly, Robert heard a cicada chirp coming from the leafy branches of that tree. He remembers cicada sounds reverberating in that forest of that dream he has seen, where a man was brutally murdered. He stands up in panic and flees from that dew-drenched grassy playground towards the pink-painted school corridors. Chirag. Mangal returns outside from his story hearing Chirag's voice with shock. He saw Chirag standing aside from the desk near him holding a postal packet. Mangal. What the bro? Don't do that. Again. Okay. What is it? Chirag. Don't get too much inside a fiction. Yeah. Ordered these pills. It came in the evening. Mangal. Put that on bed. Chirag goes out of the room smiling while Mangal glanced towards his shaking hands and holds them together. Chirag loudly. What are those pills for? 
Mangal. It takes away fatigue. I'm always sleepy, you know. How will I climax this shit when I always dope off? Mangal stands and leads to his bed. Opening the packet, he took out a pillbox named Colpidem X and unwraps it. He swallows one and keeps that pillbox on a wooden rack beside his bed. Narrator Colpidem X pills for insomaniacs. Okay, so he just lied. Well, I deviate a lot. Damn, I forgot that station guy. What's he doing now? That's him staring at a giant missing poster of nine girls strapped on a wooden beam of a closed shop near which several women were standing with illuminated candles and placards of We Want Them Back. Nikatan turns around and goes towards one auto driver, Bulla, age 30, sitting inside his black auto on a tattered driver's seat, watching Bhige Hoont Tere video song on a speakerphone in dim yellow light, coming from a tiny bulb fixed upon the top corner of the windscreen of that auto. Nikitan, C1 Lane, Bulla, get in. As he sits inside the auto, Bulla stops the video while putting his cell inside his pocket and the entire city's lights went out. Nikitan, what's this? Bulla, ah, fuck it. Every Tuesday is a dark night of this town. No light until two hours. Where are you going in that Piedmont terrain? I go there, down some streets. Nikitan. Ooh, ah, oh, Shekhar Mittal at his manor. Turning back a bit, Bulla glanced at him in amazement and then turns front while starting the auto. Auto starts moving crossing the cracked, bumpy road, filled with people and street dogs. Bulla. Who? The retarded? Sorry, retired loner, CI. Nikitan. Hmm, why? Bulla. New tenant? Nikitan. Yeps. Bulla. His house is haunted, can't recall. How many tenants have fled leaving that home? Nikitan. What? Bulla. Everyone feels strange about that house in that locality. People speculate that he shot many innocent in that 90 riots. And much more. As you sow, so you shall reap. He is the number one skirt chaser and fell on on his time. Deviating his focus from Bulla, Nikitan took out his purse from the back pocket of his jeans. Opening it up, he stares towards the small-sized picture of smiling Chahat Bhakji, who is in the picture with his father, Anand Bhakji. Nikitan, look for you, I have come to your city. What strange things am I hearing? I will find you even after facing all those despondent dissonances pulsating around me. Now nobody comes into heart. Your name is stuck within it, Chahat Bhakchi. He recalls those last moments that he spent in his house before departure. His father, Lakhan Burnwal, age 57, is constantly reading some newspaper with an agitated face in the hall. Lakhan. Okay, I admire it, that it's for work. But why that city? Everybody knows in his house that I hate that city. The water there is also dirty and people too are fucking bastards. No one pays to heed. I only blabber for your safety, lad. Nikitan doesn't pay attention to him and continues his backpacking in the second room furiously. Lakhan, do whatever you want. Your mother has left. Your sisters had gone. You two leave. 
I have an old mate. Take his address. 2K. Will he take as rent? Address is on that fucking table. He used to be a circle inspector doing oxy welding and cutting shit nowadays. Nikitan. Nupur went missing. Sunita married of her own will and left us. And mother left with that sleazy bastard. Entire fucking life went into the marginal insanity of this turf. Who is responsible? Nikitan looks at the wall-hanged framed picture of his mother, smiling in the center while holding the shoulders of Nupur, elder sister of Nikitan, aged 19, and Sunita, middle elder sister, aged 10, on her both sides. Tears shine upon Nikitan's eyes. He wipes away the tears and closes all the chains of the backpack. As he picks up his backpack, that small-sized picture of Chahat fell upon the floor from the table by the swaying wind. Nikitan remembered the moment that happened a year ago while he picked up that photo. The cold wind is blowing while carrying drops of rain along in it as it was cats and dogs out there. An indistinct rumbling of black clouds pulsates the surrounding environment, which is embracing the siturism of rain-drenched leaves. Nikitan is standing outside of an old bus stand, holding palms of bespectacled Chahat, age 26. After some moments, they sat on the rusty iron bench of that bus stand. Staring at her beaming lips with love, Nikitan gently kissed her wet palms. She turned down her face towards another side with shyness. Rain stops after some moments. She stands up and starts walking forth towards the rain-drenched street. He watched her go with wet eyes and smiling lips. She turns with a smile and waves her hand to bid goodbye to him. With a beam, he raises his hand to bid a bye to her and shockingly returns to the present moment hearing Bulla's voice. Bulla. Your mythical manor has arrived, comrade. Nikitan looks at Bulla with an agitated face while paying him and comes out of the auto. He glanced around obscurely and a light came back there while that auto wheeled away. He peered towards the street lights and turns forth to notice the white painted house which looks very shady. Turning back and forth his eyes stuck on the peaks of a remote mountain range which is peeping from behind that manor. He opens up the rusty grey metal gate while staring towards the house and the garden around it. The garden is full of dried leaves of a giant bunyan tree proximate from that house. This house is a two-storied which look like a 1600 square foot five-bedroom one surrounded by the soiled metal fence. Nikitan turns sideways to see other houses in the neighborhood, which is also very big and quirky. The two neighborhood bungalows look like carcasses of some wealthy manors, but Mittal's fifthdom looks creepier. Nikitan seems like nothing mice and place out here in the neb. That huge tree completely covers the orange rays of street light, which bounds the tension around. Nikitan walks slowly while he notices someone locking the posterns. He stands there holding his backpack. Shaker Mittal, age 58, after locking, starts walking towards the gate and his raunchy eyes 
stuck upon Ninkatan's face. Shekhar, with an intense and angry face, slowly walks towards him. Shekhar, what's the matter? What do you need? Nikitan, I... I am a Nikitan, Burnwal. Shekhar came closer to Nikitan at a slow pace. Shekhar, Burnwal's nipper? Nikitan, yeah, yeps, you gotcha. Shekhar, follow me. He turns back and starts trolling towards the garden while checking his pants pocket. Nikitan wipes away sweat from his forehead as he follows him. As they walked, passing that sewing banyan tree, Nikitan noticed a hell lot of yellow oleander trees around their grubby pathway. The surrounding around is filled with petrichor coming from the dried fallen leaves and flowers of oleander. Nikitan, fucking anthophile. Shaker goes towards a small cabin on the corner side of the garden. The place looks creepier as it is on the dark side of the garden, where even the speck of street lights did not reach. Nikitan halts after some steps as it was too dingy to go further. He took out the cell from his jeans pocket and turned the flashlight on to see the way. He became terrified seeing Shekhar standing right in front of him. Shekhar took the cell from his hand and goes towards that cabin. While Nikitan stands there astounded. Nikitan, what the fuck man? Illuminating the corridor lights from the outside switchboard, he approached Nikitan and gave back his cell to him. Shaker, all switches for hall and cabin corridors are out there. Take this key. Nikitan took the keys from him. Shaker glares at him with lowered eyebrows. Shaker, one more thing, brat. My pop used to say, Licking dicks doesn't quench the thirst of any clit living in this world. This world is thirsty for snack pots and other gal. It's better to be a monster than licking dicks. That's why I don't lick dicks. Entertain yourself with this fishbowl. Never ever try to nag your butt into my dealings. Meantime, find another house within two months. Have given your anak in only two months. Shekhar turns back and stoops out towards his lightless house. Niketan glares at him with suspicion while he walks near the locked cabin doors and starts opening the lock with that key. As he opens the doors and turns on the cabin light, he Panicked, encountering two jackals sitting on the bed and falls on the floor. Astounded, jackals jumped on the floor and fled from the posterior open windows of the cabin. Nikitan, ah, holy clit! He stood up and came out of the cabin running behind one of those jackals. As he looked around, he saw the obscure figure of Shaker standing near the main house, staring towards the cabin with folded arms. Nikitan, such an errand! Nikitan went inside the cabin and closed the doors desperately. After some hours, he is brushing his teeth and spitting on a gritty and grubby white sink while seeing his face in a cloudy mirror with a grimace. He finished his stuff and went towards the bed in agitation. As soon as he laid his head on the pillow, 
he heard a very low and vague thudding sound from beneath the bed after every few seconds after ignoring it for a few moments he stands out of bed in rage he turns on his cell flashlight and looks beneath the bed there was nothing inside it but that sound is still coming from beneath he placed his ear on the floor and heard the faint squeaking of rats coming from beneath the floor he lay back on the bed with anger and throws the cell aside of the pillow the next morning nikitan woke up abruptly hearing the clacking of some cylinders happening outside yawning he strolls outside stroking his wavy hairs shaker is standing near his gate watching a person who is taking out some bottled gas cylinders from a lorry and moving it inside the house he goes near and stands next to him niketan ah last night was the horrible night of my life washroom stinks like shit and rats were flapping their dicks all around overnight fucking my sleep do something about it shaker i have got an excuse its solution fuck your ass out of my property puzzled and enraged niketan glared towards his raunchy face and then back to his cabin rapidly walking while shaker glares at him from behind furiously narrator all means indications allusions whatever you can call it gives a lot of information about the fourth happenings our shankya shastra gave very detailed knowledge on this matter this shastra requires decoding so that it can be applied in our present scenario like in one means of knowledge according to this shastra known as anumana or inference we must reach a new conclusion and truth only by applying a reasoning from one or more past observations and previously found truths like when you hear an indistinct wailing of a siren you guess that either someone is going to get hospitalized or someone's house is on fire then you see smoke arising from some distance and conclude that there was a fire somewhere in your neighborhood many indications have had been observed and stored in some of old treatises created by sages it was an observational science however we didn't give a fuck about our older vedic testaments well on this starry black midnight under the ash filled shed of pwd garage mangal is watching some terrific news of a ghastly incident mangal is sitting on the edge of the bedstead holding the tv remote while watching a news channel which was reporting live from outside the taj mahal palace hotel inside from which terrorists were firing bullets outside from the top floor windows he switched off the tv and stared towards yadav who is snoring in full sleep while murmuring very slowly as he gets down from the bedstead he saw an empty rum bottle lying on the floor he glared towards jadav and threw it away out of the office boundary from the open skylight of that garage hira is sleeping on the floor with ease nearby that bedstead mangal saw her with a smile and turns off the light suddenly 
Jadav farts very loudly and turns towards the other side of the bedstead. With a grimace, Mangal walks out of the garage and sat upon the iron bench placed aside that garage. He took out earphones from his pocket. Plugging it with the cell, he searched for the binaural beats live video. He clicked on one of the live videos which have the binaural beats music and the rotating earth visual. That music and scenario were very much soothing. While everyone in the video is talking to each other in live comments. Mangal reads those comments for some time as his eyes become heavy and he fell asleep. Within a moment, Jadav shakes him and he woke up in shock. Jadav is smiling while strolling towards a thin neem tree carrying a water jug which is some steps away from the garage. He put that jug on the nearby cemented floor, jumps and plucks out one leafy twig of that neem tree and starts plucking out leaves of that twig while staring at Mangal. Jadav, let up Likak Sahib, sun is rubbing its ass on hills and you are still dopey? Mangal, yeah, I am awake. Just this ambient is doping me up. Mangal glances towards Jadav with his dozy eyes, who is cleaning his teeth with that neem twig. He finds that video is still playing on cell and earphone is dangling on his left leg. He stops the video and put the cell and earphone inside his jeans pocket. After taking an elongated yawn, he stands up and strolls towards the small garden, opening that perforated tap which was beside the flag hosting platform. He cleaned his face with the sloshing water and again sits back upon the bench near the garage. Jadav why you sat whole nights? Can get a stiff neck? Sleep is necessary. Jadav puts some water into his mouth from the jug in his hand and starts gargling and spitting water upon the nearby grass. Mangal. I have put the reason inside elephant's ass for now. I'm going. Yeah, do the handover for today. Where is Hira? Isn't he around? Jadav nodded in yes while gargling. Mangal stood up and starts walking out of the office and suddenly he heard Jadav's voice coming from very close to him. Jadav laughing. Where are you lost, pal? Mangal glanced here and there but could not find Jadav. Suddenly, he turns back to see the office and finds out that he is still sitting on that same bench. Mangal shakes his head in confirmation and found himself sitting at that bench. Panicked, he ran towards the small garden and splashed water on his face thrice from the tap. He glanced at Jadav who is still gargling and spitting water upon the grass. Mangal rubs his eyes and tries to sum up what just happened with him some moments ago. Jadav Yeah, fine, pal. Mangal I was there or here. Jadav I'll give that handover shit. Go home and take some sleep. Shall I drop you or... Mangal. Nah, I will manage. We'll meet at night. Jadav looks at him with a sly smile while throwing that used twig on the nearby grassy ground. Mangal walked out of the office and passed beside Hira 
without noticing her, who is laying aside the street. Chapter 2 Interconnected Blind Spots Mangal is still contemplating about the momentary lapse of his sanity and rubbing his eyes while passing by the nearby restaurant and suddenly it starts raining out there with the indistinct rumbling of clouds and Hira ran inside the office premises while Mangal went under the nearby restaurant's shed, which is on the opposite side of the main door. Drops were splattering over the glass door of that restaurant, which was in the direction of the rain. The building and the decor are charming with elegant modern touches. There is an old school neon sign upon the navy blue wall behind the concrete table which reads, The Crayons the vinny plant that clasp to those navy blue walls ever so freely and that classic pizzeria look with the checkered tablecloths give it a natural yet warm appearance. Nikitan is sitting with Sunita while watching the glass wall where Mangal is standing outside with folded arms hearing the Sithurism of Ashoka trees. She splurs one sip of the coffee while staring at the somber eyes of Niketan. Sunita. Coffee is getting cold. Niketan. Tea, really? I mean, I have not come this far to sip up this shit. Where is Chahat? Her address. Her address has to be with you. Neither you have, nor Sunita. Why are you climbing up on my ass, dude? Did I ask her to escape? Ha! Huh. Forget it. I am not going to give you any address. Just go back home. She rants away with some punk. Why don't you understand? Niketan. It's not more than shitty folklore. A fucking odious claptrap. She loved me. She loved me more than her life. You understand? And... Sunita. Nico. She is one of my friends. One of, not the best. One of my friends. I am not her fiancé that I'll know about every shit she does. Did you understand? Hmm. I only told you things, whatever I heard from friends. They only know that she had run away and even the society around disparaged about it. Nikitan. Fuck the society which is full of losers and make fun of those who try. Sunita. Okay, fuck him. But what about that call? There was a call from a man, from her cell that she is with him and he's happy, safe and will be back home soon. She is angry with her father, Niku. If that's not the case, then why she called over that neighbor's number? Even knowing that they didn't have that rapport with them. Think. And even a few days before her escape, her father beat her ass out as he would cut about her lover and Niketan. Fuck it. That's bullshit. If that ever happened, she should have told me. After our last meet, her cell is incessantly off. Days have changed over to months. And now all these... Sunita. Come on, I accept. Maybe you are right. So, did she came to you? Ha! Huh. Where is she? Niketan. My argle doesn't differ, D. Where is she? Sunita. See, forget it and nibble out her memories. You will beat a lot out there. 
I can't meet always like this. I have not told your brother that you have come here. Anyway, he doesn't want to have any relationship with anyone from home. And me too. She glares towards his somber eyes while he abruptly snatches away his palm from her hand. Enraged, she stands out of her chair. Sunita. Niku, understand it. It's your loss. If you don't... Sunita leaves the table abruptly, composing himself. Nikitan took out his cell from his jacket's pocket and looks towards the picture of Chahat, which has a heart frame, which is set as his cell's wallpaper. With grief, he gently touches her picture as he heard a loud thundering sound and turns beside towards the glass wall. He falls deep inside his past moments while staring the falling raindrops and windy weather outside. Narrator Some musical notes any para of some romantic reminiscence, especially this rainy weather, always lead any human to fall deep in its old salad days of love. Didn't you have heard ever embraced the petrichor and felt that special tinkling inside you? After just a second of this, we all fell down upon that memory of our first encounter with love. That's what happened with our Akim here. We are standing outside of some clubhouse in Nikitan's memory of the prior year. It's raining outside with distant rumbling of clouds. Nikitan and his group of friends were sipping rum while listening to the song Achha Sila Diya Tune Meri Pyaar Ka of Bevafa Sanam movie. This man town is the ruins of an old half-burned house with grey leaky walls. They only renovated the first room for their entertainment and left other parts as it is. All of them were sitting on a big mat on the floor. His friends were repeating the lyrics while taking rum sips in their respective disposable cups and eating snacks while he just finished his cigarette and smashed it on the nearby floor. Suddenly, one envelope containing some small size pictures falls on the floor by the cold breeze from the plastic chair which was there behind Nikitan. One of the pictures flew upon the floor and goes towards one of his friend's feet. Sharma, confused. What's that man? Nikitan. Fuck it, fuck it, fuck it, Sunil, you asshole. Sharma, who? That strobe sucker, Cam Jam. <laughs> Nikitan, angrily. Here must be Didi's pics, pulled for passport. She is late, so told him to take it home. That bitch brought snaps of some another gal, fucking Goswell. Nikitan stares at the picture continuously. Sharma also stares at the picture while coming too much close to his face. Sharma, hey! Whatever, dude. She's kunky, isn't it? Nikitan. Shut off. Pass them Cheetos and bring that pixel peeper as soon as possible. Sharma. Okay, man. Kurio. Sharma passes the snacks to other friends as he stands and goes out of the club room. Nikitan looks at that picture while taking rum sips one after another. 
he felt as if he had known this girl since his birth or even before. He put the glass aside and just focused his eyes on that picture. After a few moments, Sharma came inside the room with Sunil. The umbrella he is carrying, he placed that aside on the floor. Niketan's eyes deviate by Sharma's voice from that picture and he put that picture inside his pajamas pocket. Sharma laughs. And here comes the shutterbug. Everyone laughed. Niketan glared at Sharma and everyone became silent. Sunil, sorry bro. Niketan, come here. Niketan stands up and walks towards Sunil while he gestures Sharma to go and sit. Sharma went and sat on that mat while dancing over a crappy song. Sunil, bro, I, I was just... He put his hand on Sunil's shoulder, making him terrified. Niketan, calm down, Tabalt. Come outside. Yeah, guys, carry on. They came out of the room. Niketan took out and ignites a cigarette while standing outside on the front porch and watching the rain slowing. Niketan smokes. That photo gal didn't belong here, right? Sunil. Why, man? Niketan glared at him from the corner of his eyes. Sunil looks around for a second, then rubs his neck nervously. Sunil calmly. Nothing knows much about her. That girl is staying at Mishra's house. She is his girlfriend. I only know that much, bro. Niketan. Who? Ganshu? Your father-in-law, right? <laughs> Sunil. Mm-hmm. She is Mamta's friend. Niketan. Hmm. Do one thing. Like the way all her pics came here, send my pics to her too. Sunil. Wait. I didn't got a why. Niketan. Why you use this shit you didn't possess? Just do what I said. Those pics you pulled last week. Those ones. Now fuck off. Niketan gestures him to go. Sunil goes inside the room with a bowed face. Niketan took out that picture from his pajamas pocket and stared at it while smiling. He threw that burning cigarette on the nearby wet grass and went inside the room. Narrator In this short period of my life so far, I have at least found that Euphoria knows nothing about maths. And when the time comes, we all kill our mocking bird to sustain the maths, as it's essential for our survival on this earth. What a hoax! I mean, brilliant one! The next evening near some rusty and decrepit storehouse, three boys were continuously beating one boy upon the cemented floor. While Niketan is smoking some dope, sitting on his Rajdoot some distance away from them, indistinct train sound is coming as if the station is nearby. Suddenly, his cell rang. Staring at the sun setting behind dark clouds, he picks it up while throwing that dope aside. Niketan. Hmm. Sunil hears the distinct crying of some boy coming over the cell from the other side. Sunil. So master's lad finally got the garrison finish. 
murmurs with a sly smile. Hey, that girl with her mate went to the studio this evening, asking whereabouts of her pictures. She's with me now. What do I say her? The boy is crying and apologizing to Nikita. Some steps away, as the three boys continue thrashing him. Nikitan, tell her I am coming there. He cuts the call, puts his cell inside his jeans pocket, and kicks his Rajput. Nikitan, you can't suckers. Whenever I return here, his alpha beta must be shoved here. His camera, got it? One of the three boys nodded. Nikitan rides on and after passing some street light filled shady roads, halls near an Ashoka tree, where Sunil and Chahat were standing. The melodious music of Khuda Jane song, a Bachanaye Hasino movie, was pulsating around, coming from a distant place where colorful Kongming lanterns were flying atop on the evening sky. Nikitan peered there at the sky for a moment and then glanced towards her. She is wearing pink framed glasses while holding a red envelope clutch purse. Chahat peers at him continuously. He gestures Sunil to go. Sunil nodded with a twinkle and left the place on his bicycle. Chahat is glancing at him continuously. Nikitan took out his cigarette pack, lit one, and kept the pack back inside the jeans pocket. Nikitan, you are Sunita's mate, right? Say something. Ooh, you are wondering how I know that. She's my sis, ya yeah, no? You don't, I guess. Well, I am a Niku. Chahat forwards her hand with a pale face while Nikitan stares at her with a grimace. Nikitan. Well, okay. He took out the envelope containing her pictures from his back pocket and gives it to her. Chahat abruptly turns back and puts the envelope inside her red purse. She chuckles softly after strolling forth some steps, Nikitan throws the cigarette aside. Nikitan shouts. Whoa, wait! Can I drop you somewhere? Chahat continued strolling forth. He breathes out while kicking his Rajdut and ride away, turning back. Chahat pauses and turns back to see him go with a beam. She turns forth carrying her smile watching the stars and strolls forth embracing the synchronous pithurism of Ashoka trees under the folded arms. Narrator Sometimes we didn't notice the place or surrounding around us when we are on our euphoria. But our subconscious mind does and when we again somehow find ourselves in a similar ambience, we unconsciously fall into the old era which we had lived. We encounter someone for the first time and in just a second boom, they became an irresistible part of our lives. Maybe we have lived it all before this incarnation of ours. I know it sounds ridiculous, but philosophy is the grandfather of science. Okay, there you see both of them didn't sleep that night until dawn. An evening of the next day, Nikitan is sitting in the city park on a green rounded frog-shaped bench with the same friends and he is continuously staring towards Chahat who is sitting some distance away from him with two girls on a cemented white blue bench. 
she is also continuously staring towards him with a faint smile park is plastered with couples children and silent hookers niketan stands up after catching her glance niketan just a sec sharma notices them continuously staring at each other while niketan walks in her direction sharma thakur to gyo every friend laughed aloud as he walks slowly and straight towards her seeing him coming chahat smiles for a second turning down her face then gestures her friends to leave the place showing the time from her cell niketan saw that they all were leaving while chahat sneaks a bit towards him then turns forth and starts strolling with her friends towards the exit he ran towards the exit crossing the crowd circumambulating around a snacks hawker as he came outside the city park he finds her sitting alone holding her same red purse on a crowd free bus stand's bench which was some steps away from that park ami chini go chini song of charulata movie is coming out from the loudspeaker hanged on a tree proximate to the entry gate of that park resounding around niketan strolls towards her while igniting and puffing a cigarette he waved and sat beside her on that rusty iron bench of the bus stand niketan hi so what's the matter she grimaced and coughed after inhaling the smoke he looks towards her in awe niketan okay you want me to okay fine he throws the cigarette on the floor and smashes it under his shoe niketan see gone now can we talk she looks at the front road without answering with a faint smile niketan look i am not that kind of guy you know just want to be your chatmate she looked at herself for some time then started looking forward again niketan so you will not even chat with me right fuck man look you can at least give your number ha huh. okay glance at me once am i that rejectable for you she looks towards his twinkling face and hides her beaming face towards another side with downcast eyes niketan noticed a bus approaching the bus stand suddenly she took out a pen from her purse holding his right palm she wrote her cell number upon it he stares at her tenderly while she stands up enters inside the bus and sits on the first window seat with a beam niketan strokes his hair while the bus went away from his front spewing black smoke He returned to the present moment hearing the loud rumbling of dark clouds. Wiping away tears from his eyes, he gestures a waiter to come towards him. Who is taking orders from some table? The waiter came near to his table, who was none other than Jayant. Jayant smiles. "Yes, sir. How may I help you?" Niketan said Here's the bill and keep the change Jan Thank you sir Niketan moves out of the restaurant with a pale face with a beam Jan kept the rupees 100 note inside his back pocket and gave the rest of the money to the billing counter 
narrator. We all live in a small world. We may have analyzed it big, but we force our ways to influence each other in one or the other unconscious events caused by us. Our astrology also tells this. I had read and researched a lot of things in between the recession period of my life. One of them was Jyoti Shastra or astrology. Astrology was not a job then to earn money by making someone guilty, which it became now. But like science, it gives us the means to get rid of the side effects of karma's chain reaction for a limited time. Do you know that astrology can't relieve you from your suffering permanently? No, you don't. No matter how much it saves you from falling into an abyss, the energy of your kundalini is such that you will run back on that same path of destruction time after time. Ah, duty of an astrologer was to warn you that even if you go ahead on that path by mistake, you must make sure to never forget to read those warning boards before it's too late. Ah, it was a service, not employment, which it became now. Well, people don't know that we are trapped inside a gigantic and immeasurable web of karma in which all we can do is either we can produce a new chain reaction or just sit around calmly and witness this mayhem like sages. Sometimes we wonder why this is happening to us. However, occurrence of certain events is necessary not just for us, but for the well-being of this whole world. Now, me must focus on a Mangal, who is continuously typing on his PC while taking a sip of tea from a white cup inside this room, imagining the story, which he is writing about a character named Robert. Mangal. Robert ran inside his school campus. He pauses near a washing basin and began to wash his eyes. Robert ran inside the school premises and he came across a washing basin. He opens the tap and splatters the water thrice upon his face. He took out his handkerchief from his navy blue pants back pocket and walks towards his classroom while wiping his face with it. He quietly sat upon his last bench near the window which gives a direct glance to the outside playground of it. Mangal Sound of school bell ringing reverberates around for the period change. Robert is still lost in thoughts, unable to forget those happenings of that deadly night. And here again, that dumb teacher arrived to torture his guts. School bell rang. Children were talking with each other loudly. Chaos fades away as a loud sound of duster smacked thrice upon the table, reverberated into whole class. Science teacher is in the classroom. Teacher took one chalk from the nearby wooden table and wrote on the blackboard in bold and italic, Gravitation, Types of Forces, Centripetal. Teacher turns towards student. So lads and ladies, we will read today about a different kind force. <coughs> Due to this force, life on earth exists and we all too. We call it centripetal. What we call it? Children. Centripetal. Teacher. And what is it? Whole class started discussing about the question. Teacher turns towards the blackboard again 
as he draws a circle and starts demonstrating. Teacher, it is the force that has connected the earth and other planets with the sun and has connected the moon with the earth. Suppose there is an item which is revolving in a circle and it is tied with a rope in a center. Therefore, it will keep revolving like this. Therefore, when the item is here, its velocity is in this direction and go ahead. If the item is here, then its velocity will be on. Students, in that left direction? Teacher, correct. Come on, now use your imagination. So if, suppose, the item is here and we break the rope, this will go straight? Students, to that direction, teacher, correct. So every time this item moves, the velocity will change. Whenever velocity changes, there must be the presence of some force. Velocity never changes without a force. You all know Newton, uncle, right? Every student laughed aloud. Teacher turns back towards the blackboard and starts rubbing it with the duster. Teacher, yeah, you better know him. He is good for grades. His first law tells us that an object will continue moving along a straight path unless acted on by an external force. The external force is coming from the center, which is known as the students. Centripetal force. Teacher smiles. Correct. This force regulates the item from that center, causing this item to revolve around that force until that force relaxes after completing its work. Like that sun will die someday and that force too which is inside it and the responsible for solar cycles of our earth. Students started discussing and talking with each other. Suddenly, that teacher stared towards Robert, who is watching outside the window. The teacher took one chalk and starts demonstrating. Teacher, hey, watch a live example, this chalk. Maintaining his speed is moving in a circular motion and bingo! The teacher started rotating his hand in a circular motion as he bluntly throws Chalk upon Robert. Chalk hits Robert's forehead and he turns towards the teacher with a scared face. Everyone started laughing in the class. Teacher, look, as I remove the force, the item went straight in that direction. Why? Mr. Sleepyhead wants some pillow to lie on. Robert stands up in shame with bowed head. Teacher, hey, Giko, why don't you go outside and curl up on that wall for me? Come on, go. Robert went out of the class with a bowed head and sad face. Everyone in the class laughs at his departure. He stands outside while wiping his teary eyes. Mangal came out of his imagination and rubbed his hair with his hands. He shuts off the PC as he took his handbag, which is there on the bed. He passes behind Chirag, who was playing some game on his PC. Mangal goes out of the flat while thinking about the story. Mangal mumbling, Robert, what will you do after that? Will you meet any girl? But where? No, nah, boring idea. Mangal sneaks at the two cops who were entering inside Anand Bakshi's flat. He deviates himself and goes down the flat using the staircase. He watches the yellow-painted evening sky 
while exiting the apartment's gate. Strolling out of the apartment building premises, Mangal passes by next to Jayanth, who is standing outside a mobile store with a recharge voucher in his palm. Jayanth, chewing something. Kill the rest of the power recharge, okay? The stall owner nodded in yes while spitting out pan masala on the outside grassy ground. Jayant scratches that voucher and recharged it. After recharging, he throws the voucher angrily while dialing a number and walking furiously back and forth under a nearby closed shop shed. After some rings, someone picks up the call. Jayant angrily. Cunt sucker! I will peel your balls like an orange squeezer. Where is my money? Ya bill end? Was that your hooker mother who inspired you to steal from innocence? Ha! Are you eating someone's willy now? Why so mute, asshole? Person on the other side, angrily, with intense voice. How many times did I repeat to you? Scalawag! It's the wrong place you are messing with. A fucking wrong number. You know whom you are talking to? Watch your back, son. Chant. Yeah, sure, bitch, I know. Seth Cohen for all the Rockies out there. Even one is here in front of me. When I took your name, his little Willie became King Kong. You know who Rocky is? He's the local dog in our area. That person cuts the call. Jayant angrily. Yeah, yeah, cut the call, asshole. He again dialed the number, but it was off. Jayant mumbles angrily. Son of a bitch! I will snatch out my money even from your corpse. He walks down the street until he goes to his house. As the door was already open, he went inside. He saw his mother weaving a sweater sitting on a wooden chair in the veranda. Mother, here comes the brat of Naperville after sweat boiling La Course play. Have you found any other newbie for some shortcut jobs, my lad? He began to take off his shoes agitatedly while sitting on a sofa. Giant angrily. Don't start again, mom. I'm already in a bad mood. Mother, your butt only cracks at home upon this oldie. Not a quiff out there. You know what? You are just a taint for me. Just a useless itchy taint. Finishing my savings upon his debaucheries and yells at me. Jant stops opening his shoes while glaring towards her. Jant angrily. What? Debauchery? Oh, what a glorious time of my life for whom I wanted to get a job. Only for your treatments, mom. Debauchery, huh? The boy used to clean utensils in the restaurant. He fled away anonymously. Should I tell someone there only to become a laughing stock for them? It will become more difficult for me to work there. After that, that inspector is a sleazy bastard. He too sucks my brain off. That Sam Stars was threatening to put me in jail. I know those brown nosers. They all do that shit to minimize the criminal records of the area under them. I know, mom. They do it all for their promotions and post. Mother infuriated. Oh, you know that much, right? Then why hadn't you summarized about that shit inside your fucking brain? Why you flushed 80,000 into their butthole? That was your father's lifetime holdings, you asshole. Jant angrily. Now what to do? Huh? Should I hang myself? It was a mistake. I used to think that I would get a government job. Have I gambled or what? Mother sobs and shouts. Scream aloud, lad. You only apply your strength 
upon this oldie and are a pussy for others out there. Jayant again put on his shoes and left the house with a tearful eyes. After walking some distance, he sat on the steps of a small Shivaling temple which was there nearby his house. He cries incessantly while looking at the Shivaling and vigorously rubbing his hands together in sorrow. He remembers the past moments which occurred months ago where Biplab, cleaner boy age 33, is standing with him outside the crayons while showing his cell screen to Jayant. Jayant excited. Oh, ah, Biplab, what a piece of news. This is an online form website. 1,123 vacancy is out for railways posts. Biplab, yes, brother, that's right. I've already filled it. You should also fill. If you get a government job, you will also be able to treat your mom's varicose veins. My poverty will also go away. It's an MR quota. Look in this message. Jayant, does it happen? Biplab, don't know. But my four friends have also filled. Some days have passed. Jayant is reading some GK books when his cell started ringing and he picks up the call. Jayant, hello. Someone. Is it Jayant? I am speaking from RRV. Did you fill the online form? Jayant. Yep, sir. Someone. See, this form is in MR quota. MR for ministerial. You don't have to do the exam to qualify. Recruitment will be upon the higher secondary pass out marks. Jan. Um, uh -huh, okay. Someone. As you know, nowadays there is also the setting atmosphere. That's why we are asking every candidate whether they want to avail this option. <coughs> Some amount will be charged against the post. And this is completely legal for the fact. As you know, it's a matter of government and the transaction will be online. So transparency will remain. Jant, excited. Okay, sir. So what am I to do? Someone. You will receive a link on your cell. Pay at the link. Whatever position you have filled, the amount will be below that. After the transaction, you will get a five-page form. After printing and filling, post it to the RRV address with a one rupee revenue stamp. The address will be on the last page of that form. Wish you luck. Jant. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Cell cuts abruptly. Jayant stands up on his bed and started dancing for some moments barefoot. He then goes near to the Lord Shiva wall-hanged picture which was near to his bed and looked at it with folded hands. For some moments with happiness in his eyes. Jayant then came out of his bed and opens its desktop quickly and connects to the internet from his cell using data cable. The next came to his cell with a link. He types the link on the PC browser and searches for it. Narrator Ah, those bastards had made it so well that it looks like an authentic web page. The rate chart of every post was there on it. Helper 80,000 TTE 2 lakhs Station Manager 4 lakhs He became sad seeing those high rates as he heard his mother's coughing sound 
coming from the next room. With grief, he stares at the wall-hanged picture of his father, Sunil Yadav. With teary eyes, he clicked upon the helper tab and paid the amount online using his MasterCard. After completion of the payment, a five-page PDF appears on the screen. Jant prints the form with a smile while seeing the big Indian Railway logo watermark on the center of the first page. The logo is circular with the frontal shot of a steam engine equipped with the signature cowcatcher guard and the centerpiece. The unique emblem of the government of India is in the middle. Circularly enclosed to the steam engine are ten stars. He counts the stars with a smile thrice and laughed with wet eyes. He wiped away his tears and started towards other pages. It has an official government letterhead consisting of a stamp on the center of every page, which has personnel office, Fairly Place, Kolkata, West Bengal, written on the round portion of the stamp, and on the center of the stamp was inscribed Eastern Railways. On the last page, there is a signature with a post written Assistant Personal Officer RECCT, Eastern Railway, Fairly Place, Kolkata. Jant keeps the form inside the drawer of his PC desk. He went to the next room and hugged his mother from behind, who is weaving a sweater sitting on a bedstead. Mother, frustrated. What? Jant smiles. Government job is about to take place, mom. Now all will be good. Wait until I bring sweets and fritters from the market. He put on his thongs and went out of the house. Mother frustrated. When will he mature? On the next day, Jant signs his attendance register while he stares here and there in search of Biplab. Jant. Hey, did you see Biplab? Register man. Nope, haven't seen him today. Jant dials Biplab's number and find out that it's switched off. His face fades away a little bit while he put the cell inside his pocket and starts doing his job. As the sun is about to set, Jayanth came out of his restaurant and starts walking slowly. He pauses near a bus stop as his eyes met with a nearby PWD office entry gate. He walks near the entry gate and stares at the Indian Railway logo with a smile. Bearded Mangal is staring at him, standing aside from the entry gate with a grimace, while Jayanth starts counting the stars of that logo. Jayanth smiles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Shocks! 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There were 10 in the form. <laughs> Strange as fuck, you bro. Come over here. Mangal goes near him, strolling with folded arms. Mangal, confused. Ha, ah, what? Jayant points out the logo. Jayant laughs. Get it fixed, man. 16 stars up. Ten should be. Mangal looked at him with a sly smile and placed a hand on his shoulder. Mangal. What? How much? Jayant stammers in confusion. Ten should be. Why? Mangal smiles. Brother, the logo is perfect. There will be sixteen stars only. Sixteen stars out there represent sixteen zones of railways. So that's why there are sixteen stars on that logo. Ten stars. 
Mangal walks back inside the gate with a weary smile. Jain's face fades away. He opens the internet in his cell and searches for the stars in the railway logo. He placed his palm over his head with shock after finding it to be 16. He dialed the number of that RRB agent with dismay and found that it was closed. He then dialed Biplab's number and found that his number was also closed. The cell slips from his hand and fell some steps away rolling upon the grass. He falls on that grassy roadside with a jerk and faints away. Jayant came back to the present moment and wipes away his eyes. Jayant sobs. Why God? What was my mistake? Everyone used to tell me that these poor people are like hookers, not loyal to anyone. Don't increase friendship with him. But I continued on the path of a righteousness. I treated him like my brother. And he did this to me. Goodness in the world will end one day. Jayanth walks out of the temple, steps angrily. Narrator. Hmm. Blaming the unknown, as I said earlier, a job on the railway is an ultimatum for many people. So far, it has completed 156 years of its grandeur. Despite being life as a byproduct of British colonial rule, India's railway have defined and shaped the country during the prior century. Tracks that were laid to fill the caskets of foreign investors and to promote a reign had never envisaged that they will be metamorphosed completely to support the country by building a vast network. Although rail services in India were initially proposed in the 1830s, historians cite 16th April 1853 as a kickstarter for India's passenger rail revolution. On this date, the country's first passenger train departed on a 34-kilometer journey between Bodibandar Station and Thane in Bombay. It covered 14 cars by three steam locomotives and carried 400 passengers. From 1869 to 1881, it took control of railway construction from outside contractors and expanded to help the famine-affected areas in the country after intense drought. By 1880, the length of the network had reached 9,000 miles with arrivals from the three major port cities of Bombay, Madras and Calcutta. New passenger facilities began in the 1890s, including toilets, gas lamps and electric lights. Railway's popularity had soared by this point and congestion led to the construction of a fourth class on board. By 1895, India had started manufacturing its locomotives and by 1896, it was able to send its specialists and equipment to assist in the construction of Uganda Railway. Oh, wait a minute. I mean, it's a comprehensive blog, which I was reading yesterday. I'd thought to put it here, but it's becoming a pain for my ass now to mention all of that. You can find about the vast grandeur of the lifeline of India anywhere online. I just wanted here to mention that aura in which wannabe taxpayers end up being screwed by the loathsome rascals. I just wanted to convey here 
that don't be prey for any of the broken dick skull out there. Whatever you are and whatever you do. Okay, as we now stand at midnight hours inside the PWD premises, let's see what our mainstay is doing. Mangal is reading a novel titled The Lost Leaf Quest of the Ring Part 1 while sitting upon a white wooden chair Jadav came in a drunken state and lay down on the bedstead with his stinky mouth towards Mangal's side He glares at him for a few moments and then turns to the novel again Jadav grumbling sluggishly. Lekhak Saab, where do you live? Lekhak Saab never asked. No, never. But I'll ask today. Tell me. Mangal, near C2 Lane, that apartment building beside the Kalima Temple. Jadav mumbles. So you live in a flat. That thing is odious for guys like me, you know. It's like, um, how do I put it? You hear their farts, they hear yours, you know. I hate that kind of shit. Mangal. Um, hmm, sort of. Mangal turns to the next page and Jadav turns his face towards the other side. Jadav. Lekhak Saab, what you're reading? Mangal, while reading. A novel of some guy named, ah, Shire Aviral, which is, he turns towards Jadav and saw him snoring in deep sleep. Mangal, beyond your comprehension, you faggy ass. Keeping that novel inside a handbag, which is hung upon a nail on the garage wall. He took out the Colpidem X pills from the handbag, swallowed three pills and put the packet back again. After drinking some water from the nearby earthen pot, he switched off the garage lights, went out of the garage and sat upon that bench. He took out the cell from his jacket's pocket plugged on the earphones and played the same Life Binaural Beats video. He started reading those live comments on that video while his eyes began to feel heavy and shut for a moment. Suddenly one notification sound breaks his dizziness and stared towards the live comments. A girl with ID name Bagchi Chahat 08 is typing continuously after every comment with his name. Bhakti Chahat 08. Hi, Mangal. Bhakti Chahat 08. How are you, Mangal? Mangal wraps his palm for some moments, then starts typing. Sri Mangal 71. I'm fine. What about you? Bhakti Chahat 08. I'm not that fine. Sri Mangal 71. Why? Bhakti Chahat 08. I need your help. If you can call me on this number, 000930524, I will wait. Sri Mangal 71. Okay, for sure. Calling you now. As he closed his cell and looks up, he saw Robert standing in front of him, smiling with blood drenched hand. Terrified, Mangal stands up and quickly ran towards the front. He stares back at Robert, who starts strolling towards him, carrying his creepy smile and wide icy eyes. Mangal ran out of the office and starts running on the road. He pauses as he saw Robert standing in his front, some steps away from him, with that same creepy smile. He turns back with horrified eyes 
and one car directly comes near him honking continuously and hits him hard on the knees. He fell on the road with a jerk and blood starts pouring out of his back head. The driver came out of the car and approached him running. Agonizing upon the road in pain, he sees a bloody figure in front of his eyes, hears indistinct music of the song Gloomy Sunday by Billy Holiday, which is coming from the car and faints away. As Mangal opened his eyes, he found himself standing on the street outside his apartment building on the roadside. It's scorching sunny noon. The surrounding is pulsating with bhajan music of Vaishnav Jan To by Lata Mangeshkar. He turns back and finds that the music is coming out from the loudspeaker of the Makali temple, some distance away from him. He took out the cell from his jeans pocket and dials one number. After some rings, someone picks up the call. Mangal, hello Chahat. After some moments of pause, a female voice came from the other side. Female, sorry, wrong number. Mangal confused. Is that Chahat Bakshi? Female, no sir. This is a research organization's number and I am Arpita Sabarwal, manager Shire Aviral. Thank you, sir. Mangal confused. What the heck? Wait a sec. Um, I found this number online. Okay. Chahat had given it to me. She told me that. She needs a kind of help. Female. Online, sir? Mangal mumbles, Yeps, yeah, over YouTube comments. Female smiles. Okay, sir, go inside the building behind you. Mangal confused. Behind? Um, I think. Fucking fuck. As he turns back while talking on the cell, he became astonished to see that his apartment building looks too old and the location around him metamorphosed drastically. That bhajan music is no more there and he is in a different location. There were many old, drenched and dilapidated houses around that flat. The cloudy weather around is moist and soaked. That place is very much alone and silent. Female smiles. Thank you, sir. Mrityanjaya Sarvada Bhaktaya. Cell cuts. Mangal puts the cell inside his jeans pocket with confused eyes and goes inside the building in slow pace. As he enters inside, one Gorkha boy is standing there smiling who is wearing a navy blue tuxedo black bow tie with a white shirt and black pants with brown shoes. That Gorkha boy gestures to him to use the staircase. Mangal uses the staircase while looking around. Water is dripping from the dilapidated walls around and there were also a few drops of blood on the stairs. As he reaches up to the first floor, he saw one half belled man standing in the hall, staring outside a window. He is wearing a full sleeve black denim shirt with light blue jeans and black shoes. Mangal goes near that man. Half belled man, confused. Mangal went slowly and stands behind that half belled man who is continuously staring outside of the hall window. Half belled man smiles. 
Ooh, Mangal. You are very precious. This is the reason behind your presence in front of me. Mangal glares at him suspiciously. He turns around and saw that every door of the three flats behind him is locked and some blood drops are spilled on the floor. There was no trace of any other human around there. Only the sound of wind is echoing. Mangal looks towards the half belt man angrily. half belt man smiles. Aviral has created this world. He will meet you sooner. Many beings need him. Mangal confused. What is all this shit? Who the fuck are you? Half bald man chuckled. Who is Robert? Mangal angrily. Say or should I rip your balls off? You retard. Half bald man laughs. What is the mystery of the Edward Forest? Mangal angrily and loudly. You son of a... Mangal tried to hold half bald man's wrist, but his palm transpassed from inside. On seeing this, he panicked and retreated. Half bald man turned towards him and strolls forth. Half bald man smiling. Does it matter who I am? It does matter where you are. Mangal got terrified while a blood-drenched hand came upon his shoulder from behind. He turns back with horrified eyes and finds that wide-eyed Robert <laughs> giggling behind him. Mangal got up panting and saw Chirag sitting near him. He touched his bandaged head and looks around to find that he is on a hospital bed. Chirag rasps his palm slowly. Chirag calmly. Bro, it was a nightmare, nothing more. Everything is fine. Have some water. Chirag gave him some water in a glass from a water bottle which was placed upon the table aside from the bed. Mangal drinks and then again lay down on the bed while handing the glass to Chirag. Chirag calmly, what happened, bro? Huh? How did that accident happen? That oldie said that you were running towards the car directly. Shit, just muddled around too much, you know. Mangal confused, why? Huh? I mean, what happened? Chirag calmly, your bossy saved your ass. What the fuck? Were you doing outside on road during your fucking duty hours? A lot of question arose, but he managed. Take your dopes lightly, butterfly. Mangal angrily. Hey, watch your tongue. I ain't drunk any shit. Don't you know what happened? Chirag calmly. Hmm, I don't know. But that oldie has given evidence. The dashboard camera of his car has recorded everything. I have seen the footage myself. You are running towards the car like a maniac, dude. Doctor, sleepwalking. They turn towards the front hearing a doctor's voice, which is standing near the bed. Doctor with a grin. It's the case of sleepwalking. <coughs> Do you take any supplements, any additional medicines? Chirag recalled the pills that Mangal has just started taking for about a month. Mangal confused. Mm, no, doctor. Doctor smiles. Then you need a good sleep. Well, you will be released tomorrow morning. Take rest. Doctor stalls towards the other patient. Mangal stares towards Chirag's face, which was lost in some thought with tense eyes. 
Chirag recalls some old memories. First flash. Chirag is just eight years old. He saw sad Mangal, who is peeping outside from a little open part of the door of his room. Then he stares at some people talking angrily with their parents and leaving the room. His father's hand gestured him to go to his room. He left that room with somber and puzzled eyes. Second flash. Chirag embraced his mother while weeping incessantly. Chirag crying. Mama, why Giko was sent to boarding school? What did he do? Mother's brittle tone. Sugar, this was necessary for everyone's well-being. Chirag came back to the present moment hearing Mangal's voice. Mangal confused. Where are you lost, buddy? Rubbing his forehead and hairs with distressed eyes, Chirag closed his fists. Chirag whispers, This has, has, has happened before. Mangal puzzled. Wait, what? Chirag terrified. You will not eat those pills from today. Swear on me. How I forgot, damn it. Mangal smiles. Hey, what are you talking about? Chirag sobs. No, you swear. Mangal rubs his eyes. Ah, okay. I will not eat. I will not eat that again. Fine? Is it good for you? Chirag shook his head with wet eyes. Mangal smiles. Now, come here and give me a hug. Come on, Pachinko. He hugs Chirag with a beam while Chirag is still terrified. He stares towards the doctor who just exits the main ward. Chirag smiles. Take some rest. I'll be back in just a moment. Mangal lies on his bed while Chirag goes out of the room and walks towards the doctor, who handed over some papers to a nurse and started walking towards the hallway. Chirag ran towards him and taps onto his shoulder. Chirag pants. Doctor, I am the younger brother of bed number eight. Doctor coughs. <clears throat> yes, what happened? Any matter out there? Chirag stares here and there for a moment, then looks towards the doctor. Chirag stammering. Um, what you were saying there? Some sleepwalking stuff? My brother did this in childhood. Awful things happened because of that shit, you know. Didn't want that again. Can you throw some light on that? Doctor's cell dings. He took it out of his pants pocket and starts surfing. He puts it back after a brief glimpse. Doctor sighs. Hmm. Okay. Do one thing. Take this address. Take him there, okay? Take care. The doctor took out one paper from his back pocket and handed it to him. Chirag nodded, turns towards the other side and started walking while glancing at the address on that paper with a bowed head. Doctor stares towards him with a sly smile. Doctor chuckles. Avidal, you splendorous motherfucker. You always prove yourself a genius. Mrityanjaya Sarvada Vaktaya. The doctor turns towards the other side and stoops out of the halfway with a slick smile. Chapter 3 Suitors or Hedonists 
narrator. Ha! Several stories summarized together. Only one crux sometimes. We don't require a third eye to connect the dots and solve these grand puzzle of existence. We need just that unblemished attention, which our sages have called consciousness, to diverge this secret. You people must be thinking, who is this incognito jackass talking to us since inception? Well, you will know that for sure. Until then, don't stop guessing. Now glance towards those pair of blue amolite stud earrings shining from the rays falling upon it by the tube light hanging on the front porch of a hawker shop in an ongoing fair. Whole fairground is glazing with the footsteps approaching towards their leisure counters and food stalls. Several locals and visitors were enjoying mouth-watering food staff including sweets and pani puris, while the youth of the city, roaming here and there, were looking for love for themselves. Tum Bin Jao Kaha song of Pyar Kamosa movie is pulsating around from a bunch of loudspeakers hanging together upon an iron pole in the center of the fairground. Niketan picked up the pairs of those blue earrings and waved it towards Chahad, who is standing near a Panipuri stall with her companions. Some distance away from him, she nods in yes with a beam and puts the wisp of hair on the right ear, which was drooping in front of her specs. He smiled and kept it inside the chest pocket of his denim shirt. Turning back, he saw them going towards a bank stall. When Chahat saw him with longing eyes, he sighed and puts his hand on his heart while strolling towards them. Before he reached there, some boys cropped up the way and grabbed him by his shirt's collar. Golu spits out. Look, who is here? Chick banger without his tool? Gang laughed hysterically. Nikitan chucks off their hands with a grin. Nikitan gravely. I have left all that shit. So don't mess up the mood, bonehead, and carry on. Golu growls. Ballsy as fuck. You fucked my mule and got the guts to enter into my area. I'll fuck your ass like a mink, cocksucker. Nikitan gives them a bird and tried to pass forth. But Golu intervened and punched upon his mouth. He falls down on the dew-drenched grass. They booted him vigorously until some hawkers came around in between them. Shaking his head while sitting up, Niketan noticed his bleeding nose, blackened knuckles and tattered gritty sleeves. People surrounded them and some fair guards came there running. A girl appeared from somewhere and pulled out Niketan away by hands from the place towards the cheerless corner of a closed stall. Vision is flickering for some moments around Niketan until he gets a grip. He finds himself knelt on the grass behind the stall with Chahat weeping beside him. She noticed the scars on his hands and his blackened eyes. Nikitan, after jerking his head for some moments, saw one girl glaring towards him while standing in his front. Other girl, agitated tone. What the fuck was that, huh? Are you nuts? Groaning, Nikitan turns towards Chahat. Staring at her teary eyes, he kissed her forehead, kissed her hair, and wiped away tears from her cheeks. Nikitan smiles. 
only to hear her voice. Shocked, Chahat looked at him with her wide, dismayed eyes. Niketan chuckles. What? Can't you remember what you had said? Now I have earned it, right? Hearing this, she removes the specks from her sorrowful eyes, puts them on the nearby sandy ground and starts crying bitterly. That other girl, staring at them angrily, takes a deep breath. Other girl scorns. I have seen enough fanatics, but you were legit, Chahat. You ain't told him nothing about your congenital mutism, right? Bemused by the revelation, Nikitan glanced towards Chahat, who is crying incessantly with lowered eyes. He arrests his palm on hers, while she acknowledged with lowered chin, and some drops of tears fell upon Niketan's wrist from her eyes. He kisses her hair poignantly and hugs her. A drop of tear rolled down his eyes and he returned to the present moment where he is standing in front of a window while looking towards the full moon sky. A radio is ringing. Chupke's song of Satya movie with a vague a rustling on the table behind him. Sobbing while puffing the last shots, he throws the stub outside that cabin posterior window after some moments. As he turns back towards his lightless room, he is startled to see Chahat, dressed in white embroidered kameez, and plain white salwar with yellow dupatta standing some steps away from him. She goes near to him and strokes his hair. Wiping tears away from his eyes, she slowly walks back. With a beam, she starts dancing on the cabin's dark floor, which has some light from the moon. Nikitan strolled towards her to touch her and she vanished in the air while an indistinct thudding sound starts happening from beneath the floor and that a radio wheezed incessantly without any music. He falls on the floor crying out her name and thumps the floor thrice with his fist awfully. Next day, he went into the city marketplace, wondering with that bromide snap of Chahat, asking shopkeepers and some people whether they have seen her. After not finding any whereabouts of her through the whole day, he became sad and sat on an empty bus stop bench, whimpering at the onset of evening. He glanced at a teen couple walking aside the road, eating one ice cream, turn by turn while smiling. He remembers himself with Chahat, where she is continuously staring at Niketan, and he is looking towards the people passing by. She makes a face and goes towards a nearby tree. He follows her, and came back to the present moment hearing a tea hawker's voice. A tea hawker is wheeling his cart on the road while blurting out, Chai, garam, garam, chai. Nikitan, with tears in his eyes, turns towards the other side and saw that couple entering inside a bus, which just arrived near that bus stand some moments ago while the bus moved forth. Suddenly, his cell rang. He wipes his eyes and picks the call. Someone stammering. Uh, I think it's... Uh, Chahat is here. Her father is also strolling forth towards her. Ah, don't know what's... Nikitan growls. Text me the fucking address right now. 
he stands up and walks out of the bus stand furiously. Meanwhile, Jayanth came from the other side and sat upon that bus stand bench. He continuously dialed the number for several minutes until the sun gets connected. Jayanth chuckles. Oh, Pander, picked up the cell at least. What's up, dickhead? He hears the vague music of Gloomy Sunday by Billy Holiday coming over the cell from the other side. Jan sings, Dickhead, how are you? Oh, you sucking, right? I can hear you. Moaning. Someone howls. Motherfucker, son of a bitch, I'll catch you by thought and rip you off in pieces. Don't mess with my brain, you punk ass. You don't have an end link about whom you are messing up your wanker ass. Jant chuckles. Have you swallowed Viagra or something? Calm your ass down. Don't you dare to disgrace your motherfucking dad, cunt hole. Someone growls. Your dead end is knocking, son. Chant calmly. Look, return my money decently. Even I hate slaying your butt like that. Why this ruckus? Return it and continue your life. Call cuts abruptly from the other side. Chant sighs. Fuck. Invariable damsel's demeanor. At the very moment, Mangal is sitting on a sofa in someone's house while staring here and there. Suddenly, his eyes stops on a book which is kept upon a wooden rack nearby the sink. He finds out in shock that it is the same book, The Lost Leaf of Shire Avidal, which he was reading on that night of the accident. Samatran came and sat on the second sofa. Mangal smiled a bit, seeing him. Samatran smiles. Quite a fable, isn't it? Mangal smiles. Have you read it? Well, it's not that catchy until now. I grabbed a second chapter as yet. Samatran chuckles. That's right. Something are like this not exceptional from intellect's point of view which is mostly conjectured nowadays. But only after going nucleus, a being can recognize what is the rationale of that thing. Well, how are you? I was told you do sleepwalk. Mangal smiles. No, sir. My brother cares a bit. Ain't happened before. It's inchoate. Sumatran's sly smile. Inchoate? Yeah. Hmm, okay, now tell me what happened exactly that night. Mangal takes a deep breath while rubbing his bandaged head for some moments. Holding his fingers together, he looked towards Sumatran. Mangal sighs. Sir, it was like, ah, always watch videos of binaural beats on a YouTube channel named Jezebel Decibel. I think and I have heard somewhere that it helps in controlling anxiety or so. Sumatran smiles. Oh, I guess. I know about that. Listening to two different tones in two years, which produces a new one in between the difference. Sumatran took one glass of water from the plastic jug, which was at the ottoman behind his sofa, and drank. Mangal. Yes, sir. Same may be. So, um, while watching the I got sleepy, and then with dinging of some comments, I woke up again and I saw a girl was beeping in the comment section for help. Uh, also given her number. Then as soon as I turned up my head, Robert stood in front and Sumatran slurps the sip. Robert, who? He puts the glass back on the nearby ottoman. 
Mangal draws. He is the mainstay of a story I am writing. Sumatran smiles. Ah, creative mind. For a writer, function of the brain's amygdala is very important. Reason being, these people create every story from the amalgam of conscious and unconscious incidents around them. You may wonder, but before being a psychologist, I have had a movie maker in me, used to snap vlogs and documentaries with a friend. Well, what happened after that? Mangal chuckles. Oh, okay, sir. <clears throat> so his hand was stained with blood completely. I was scared, so I ran out. And at that point, accident happened. Ha! Huh, I, I also saw him in a horrendous nightmare. Mangal face palmed in distress. Sumatran patted his shoulder, while Mangal found him standing near him with a glass of water. He handed it over to him and sat back on his sofa. Mangal mumbles, Thanks, sir. He drank the whole glass and placed it on the table aside from his sofa. He sighs deeply and looks towards Sumatran. Sumatran chuckles, Don't panic, my boy. It's normal for sleepwalkers. Neurological diseases usually endanger their symptoms if the patient invokes any memory or shock for the brain, knowingly or unintentionally, that had triggered it past in the first place. It happens because of our brain's defense mechanism. Well, I know it's all Greek to you, but just always remember one thing that Everything happens in this world for a reason. Mangal's eyebrows startled and his mind reverberated with an indistinct echo of the same sentence. An obscure vision came into his mind, where someone is saying those wording to him in some building premises. But the voices and vision were too blurry to comprehend. He came back to the present moment, where he heard Sumatran blabbering something. He shakes his head and came to his senses. Sumatran writing something on a paper. And better take these pills. It will take care of the mishap, okay? Smiles. Have a great time ahead. Mangal stands up and takes the paper from his palm. Sumatran yawns. Ah. One more thing. Whenever you see him again, just takes his finger, snap. Mangal moves out of Sumatran's house while contemplating the happenings. As Mangal went out, Sumatran dials a number with a weary smile while staring at him from behind his room's window curtains. Sumatran scoffs. Done. Mithunjaya Sarvada Vaktaya Narrator So, according to you people who moves the story forward, a protagonist or an antagonist, you may anticipate that it's going to be that same boring disquisition which was brewed by the modern critics of art for proliferating their enigmatic grammar. Nevertheless, it's not that scenario. Have you ever read Srimad Bhagavad Gita? In one of its chapters, Lord Krishna mentioned about the Triguni Samsara or three qualities of life, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Many of the mystics have compared them with the atomic electrical charges in which two electrons and protons carry net charges and neutron carry no net charge. You can consider the protagonist as the Rajas, which wants to be unstoppable, and the antagonist as the Tamas, which loves to obstruct anything moving with the same force as Rajas. Here, to balance them, 
you can acknowledge the sattva or nature. Sattva equips the two of those energies to let the story move forward with its yin yang. Nevertheless, the crux of this sermon is tamas and rajas are inseparable. Ah, there, Nikitin is sitting inside an auto rickshaw, noticing the foggy air flowing outside, carrying tinsy droplets in it. Ah, butems at Bellevue. Nikitan is sitting inside an auto, seeing the mist outside. He falls deep in the flashback with wet eyes, where the foggy evening was beaming with the yellow sky. He is walking on the roadside while chatting with Chahat over his cell. Nikitan, you didn't even tell me your name. I mean, it's been a month of chatting between us. And I haven't heard a word from you. Come on. Chahat. But you only wanted to be a chapman and I fulfilled your wish. Now you are asking for more. Am I referring the same which you have in your mind? Nikitan. Duh. How would I know about your inference? But I am craving to hear your voice. Chahat. That's not possible. As you are still a stranger for me, I only heard low about you from my girlfriends. Nikitin pauses for a second with distress and then starts typing again. Nikitin, is that so? Uh, still you chatted with a low guy for a month, wasting your etiquette for what? Chah, don't know, maybe. I like you, that's why I think. Nikitin beamed receiving this text and punched the air. Cell dings again. Chahat. But don't get me wrong. I meant to say as a chatman. Nikitin. See, whatever, I made the cut. Just call me. I really want to hear you. As a chatman only. Chahat rolled over on her bed to the other side with radiant lips. Chaha typing. If it's that precious, you gotta earn it. Nikitan smiles while typing. Nikitan. And what I have to do for that, Senorita? Chaha. You have to be a good guy who earns marks and behaves well. You have to be the one who never puts his leg on any mess. With a beam, he stares at the star-studded sky for some moments and typed on his cell. Nikita. Okay, Duke, I am changed person from now onwards. No fights, no hooch hunting. But do remember your promise. Feeling the cold breeze swing around, he puts the cell inside his jeans pocket and walks the front path with folded arms, embracing this moment of first love in his eyes and returns to the present moment with the sudden halting of the auto rickshaw. Auto driver spits out pan masala. C9 lane, old paper mill ground. Nikitan saw there was a lot of chattering crowd surrounding something under the old water tank in the ground beside the exanimate paper mill. He walks out of the auto rickshaw and past the people bit by bit, who was talking about the death of some girl. His heart was trembling like a leaf as he walks towards the water tank. Some constables and police personnel were standing some steps ahead, from a caracas lying there on the murky field, covered with a white shroud. Nikitin's heart missed a beat seeing Anand Bakchi, age 53, weeping in a sedentary position on the muddy ground aside from that corpse. Suddenly, air blows the shroud and reveals the decapitated decay torch of the corpse of a girl whose lung area had burn marks by acid and near the neck 
there were multiple marks of a deep wound done as like someone had scrapped that area brutally with their fingernails. Everyone around panicked with one of the constables placed the shroud back in its place. Nikitan went near the body and kneeled with a heavy heart and dried eyes. He stayed in that position for some moments without any emotion. Then a soft smile with tears came upon his face. He picked up the carcass with shroud abruptly and ran from the other side towards the road screeching aloud. We are one now. Everyone present there was astonished and started shouting while four constables ran towards him. He ran on that nearby bushy road screaming with wet eyes and within a fraction of a second an ambassador car hit him hard on the knees. The body slipped from his arms and fell on the nearby roadside grass. He falls a few steps away from that corpse on the road. Drawing the injured arm and blood-soaked face, towards the corpse, he fainted. Narrator Tenure granted to this zeal inside us is much adamant than even the social grace or I can firmly reassure that it's much messianic than pragmatic. Subrogating emotions and much hard for us than demolishing intellect. Whether you are a suitor or some hedonist, this world we live in will cast itself out from its own shelter of norms when the time comes for personal vengeance. That's the me thing we all have in us which leads us to criminally contend with our intellect 24-7. As Vivekananda said, everyone has the power to judge of good and evil, but he is the hero who undaunted by the waves of samsara, which is full of errors, delusions and miseries. With one hand wipes the tears and with the other unshaken shows the path of deliverance. Whimsically, Nikitan came to his senses and found himself on his rented cabin bed. Shekhar is sitting beside his bed and astutely looking towards him. Shekhar gravely. Do you want water or something? Nikitan groans while touching his bandaged back head and inspecting his bandaged arms. Nikitan groans. Ah, uh, notes. Shaker stands out and strolls around the floor angrily while glaring towards the bedridden Nikitan. Shaker blurts out. My pop used to say, fuck your cunt quietly or neighbor will fuck you up. You poured out a gigantic shit out there for me. That will take months to pristine. I am lone tough living here, saving my ass from a ravenous bastards and you made me a resham mia in this town. Nikitan glared at him with an agitated face while cursing his neck. Shaker growls. I'm going to give you three days to fuck off. Only cause of that cronky head of yours. Three days period. Shaker slams out of the cabin in rage. Spitting out aside with a scowling face. Nikitan stands out of the bed slowly and went towards the front porch of the cabin barefoot. It is a cloudy evening with the petriture of yellow oleanders gleaming around. He sat upon a wooden chair placed outside with folded arms and looked around coldly. 
squeaking sounds turned his attention towards the posterior side of his cabin where four to five rats were screeching and running around with a grimace he animates inside the cabin in slow pace changed his clothes put on his slippers and went outside in distinct music of gloomy sunday song by billy holiday coming out from that main house drift him for a moment yet he approached the main gate and went forth outside after walking some distance he pauses near a stationary store where jant just peeled and swallowed a banana while thought the skin towards nikathan's way nikathan glared at this chomping mouth then walked inside that store the store was void until jant blurted from his behind jan burps out loud oh at your service mate don't mind got a deli belly since the prior day having a ball with my volcanic ass niketan inhales with a pale face hmm you used to work at that a restaurant right jan's grin lost in thin air jan mutters ah yeah until last weekend when i broke the gritty nose of that asshole boss self respect can be punishing sometimes you know and specifically in this time when there is no country for young men niketan monotonous voice i want a rat's bane jam mumbles a what oh gotcha he took out a small pouch of a rat poison and handed it over to niketan after giving the money to jan niketan went out pauses for a moment and returned inside niketan beams you know what i want some dope will you arrange for both of us yeah i know we don't know each other but i don't have anyone now to share anything and i'll be leaving this city in some days so jant shook his head with a shrewd grin narrator every facade we conquer makes us more erudite about the forthcoming facades of grief improbity and cruelty which we had handled on our path of anonymous intent even standing at this point of my life i can't recall even a second of my past where i calmed myself down and asked about where is it all going but nowadays i am much more astute about this stuff jan and niketan were dozing off the mind with their respective hookahs and himesh rashmaiya song were playing upon a cell placed on the dew drenched grass they were sitting under a huge tamarind tree near a riverside in some forest under the half moonlight which is sliding slowly up on the horizon jan pops up so ah you are rented here and you live in satranjpur which i think is 10 miles backward <coughs> but what happened on that last meet niketan took a giant smoke out of its mouth yawned and shook himself for a second <sighs> niketan hey hey bro that day was such a fucking gold that golden tuesday which sealed a bond between us a cold breeze passed by touching niketan's face he lay down on the grass with open arms and closed eyes and falls deeply 
into that past a rather ripe moment where he is texting Chahat. Nikitan I had earned a trophy and some money from the municipal commissioner for my community services. It all happened because of her. She changed me through. So I requested her to come with me to the Lover's Paradise Park of Churusol. Jant It's a uh, uh, half past excursion from here. Both Chahat and Nikitan were standing under the roof of a bus stop. She is looking carefully at a map in her cell and he is glancing towards her flying curly tresses tied with a yellow hairband cruising gradually over the back. Nikitan Ah, um. ah she resented the idea cause there would be late night return though I was adamant and we took the bus. The cold breeze is blowing the hair lock of Chahat, who is sitting on the window side of the bus. She puts it back on her right ear, while Nikitan is looking at her tenderly. Noticing him, she beams for a moment, then digs on his chest. He grins while kissing his neck. The bus stopped near the entry gate of Lover's Paradise Park. Both came down and looked towards the gate with a dim smile. Holding each other's palms, they went forth. A variety of food stalls were set up around the gate, around which many couples were enjoying their ice creams and the zenith of zeal inside them. As soon as they entered inside, Chahat's eyes fell on a Pani Puri stall. She pulled Nikitan's sleeve and signals him to walk there. Seeing her innocence, he beams and both went towards the Pani Puri stall. Nikitan, her innocent eyes are unforgettable. That moment was so pure that I would lose everything to cherish it. Huh, this moment was my own. Not a single bit I had till now, which was so close, so much like my own, as much as this moment of being with her. They walked around the park holding each other's arms. She tells him in a gesture that she forgot her phone at home. And he calls her a fool in a gesture. She angrily starts chasing him and they ran around each other with a tender grin. Every inch of that park is surrounded by the outdoor PA sound system. Hidden inside bushes and trees, reverberating sweet instrumental and acoustic music at every corner. Park is contained with several colorful deck chairs and parasols. Some were riding on the swings and some were sitting in the long grass, talking while kissing each other. A couple passed by them while miffing with each other. They chuckled and strolled forth. Chahat indicates Nikitan to pause and they stand in a cemented path near a pond shore. The instrumental version of Samba M. Preludio by Baden Powell starts pulsating on the PA speakers around them. She takes off her glasses and starts wiping them with her dupatta. He started around and felt the surreal beauty of this silent and floral corner of the park, which is filled with lush and olden trees. Suddenly his eyes stuck on a couple sitting under an oak tree in a crowd-free grassy place, smooching each other some distance away from them. 
he holds her palm and gestures her to look towards there baffled she snatched her hand away from him with a dim smile and ran towards a lonely place under the banyan tree with a silent grin he strolls towards that tree he stands in front of chahat who is standing clinging to the tree and is breathing slowly with her eyes down rubbing the loose ends of her dupatta between her fingers once he lifted her face in his palms she closed her eyes taking warm breaths and clenched the thick moist stem of her hands piercing her ringlets aside which looked like dark clouds on her moonlike face he kissed her forehead gently tenderly stroking her open vivid lips with his thumb he felt her warm breath upon it and placed his lips on her lips and they start smooching each other niketan Has a drop of dew ever descended in your heart? Whole dusk rained upon us, like the dew of winter rains on the ground. Yet that fire kept burning inside, that fire of love for births ignited within us at that moment. The bus is driving on the lonely night road containing only two passengers inside Niketan and Chah who were sitting on the last seats holding each other's palms and staring at each other incessantly with deep love in their eyes The cold wind is flowing inside out indicating forthcoming rain and suddenly the bus halted bus driver momentous voice kali temple crossed chahat stands and left the bus with a slumber smile niketan bit her by from the window as the bus starts moving and her face fades away in the darkness splattered outside noticing the dark echoing in the outside dwellings and roads he took out his cell and text her while it starts raining niketan do text me after you reach home sugar okay niketan came back to the present moment with teary eyes jant is snoring in deep sleep beside him spitting aside niketan stands up staring towards the star-studded sky niketan blurt so what have you got snatching her from me there were thousands of hearts in the world but you clenched mine to break you have everything but what about me ah huh? he knelt on the grass with folded hands and his nose touching the grassy ground niketan cries I am a beggar now. Please give me my chahat back. Please God, are you listening? She is my life. Please. His screeches blew Jan's <sighs> love. Yawning, he rubbed his eyes, got up, and crawled next to him, stroking his back. Jan yawns. Calm your ass down, mate. You are inviting a nonsense noctivagon for dinner. Come on buddy sit here rubbing away tears from his eyes niketan crawls back they both sat under that tamarind tree jayant expectorates behind and looked front toward the disheartened niketan who is staring towards the half moon clinging his back on the chunky stem of that tree jayant scoffs We both had faced hard fucking opacity 
in this transparent world, but we differ in tackling them. I was brutally fucked by some narcissist fucks. Ah, had a close bond with one of them. That cocksucker knew all shortcomings of mine. And I, for granted, his wits. I lost many of my father's savings, and even the law of this righteous country doesn't give a fuck to handle my grief. Nikitan turns his face towards smiling Jan, who is crushing a tiny twig on his left palm with his thumb. Jan chuckles for some moment, then sniff. What to say? Now there is no belief in happiness inside me. The day I received that hoax paper of that railway job, I was beaming like a lunatic 24-7, getting a government job. Now I can get my mother treated with the loan amount and much more. We youngsters dream too much too soon. <laughs> How will it be fulfilled? Neither we give a fuck nor they who have voted. People say that selling fritters is also employment. Burn thy ass on that flames of congenital indigence and get the idea of scars which this country is accumulating. Nobody knows nothing, nothing man. There is less bread for the commune and we are casting our bread upon waters. Nikitan nodded while glancing towards the waving grass blades incessantly. Jan scoffed. Ha! Huh. Everyone is engaged in selling and buying dreams. Frauds. Seem so cool, don't they? Even movies jeopardize the image of that common diligent guy living inside all of us who was fucked by those trailblazing crimes of a cool punk. <laughs> when hero steals with Lucius music, audience whistles their balls out. No one hawks an eye that the fucked one was a straightforward, assiduous man like you. You can't count on anyone these days. Gradually this country is heading into elephant's ass. Nikitan peered towards him with a slumber smile. Nikitan excels. Man, ah, I mean, pardon my French, as we are not thick as thieves. Sighs. Hmm. However, this unexpected Thesaurus, it's all Greek from your mouth. Still, I got you, mate. Jan stared at him agape for a moment. Jan, phew, man, what are you? Some tharur of jargons? I just wanted to convey to you that don't think much or else your ass will burst like a fucking cherry bomb. Both high-fived each other with a wide grin and they noticed three night guards standing in front of them. One of the guards grabbed Nikitan by the collar and they both stood up. Night guard, shrewd smile. Having fun, fuckers? By the way, we are here to blow up your asses. Don't worry about that. I can understand your leisure of having a hookah in this pleasant moonlight. But it's my duty to fuck your enjoyment off. So come with us and enjoy. Walk towards that jeep, assholes. Guards pushed them forward furiously. All of them approached towards an ignited jeep, pulsating from steps away from them. Both of them stared at each other with a sly smile. Narrator Wow! What a piece of juice! Mm. So, in this world of commodities, we only aspire to be a consumer. We don't want to reap our fruits, only love to savor the nude one upon our tongue. You all, like Jan, fall prey 
to get rich quick schemes and curse the unknown when stumbled without realizing that you had consciously betted for that result ostentatious relations and etiquette we possessed are like flesh eater parasites eating us out slowly and assiduously ah in my time almost every puissant persona whether a lawmaker or a public servile is a narcissist bidding their own interests over the humane ones eventually some day this democratic exodus will fall into the lap of a communal genocide sometimes it seems like i am awake and everyone else is sleeping that they didn't even bother to notice this force coming i mean denarians are dying while playing online games riots are happening over movies and social platforms posts language and geographical regions have turned into identities colliding and human ripping off each other are the corollary of this hypothetical analysis in this era of online tribalism i see youngsters turning into lab rats of growth hackers who are working for persuasive digital technology i understand this psychology that location influences our behavior like talking in english to someone over a call while strolling on your non-english native roads is much harder than doing the same in american subways we can be pretentious but can't escape the fact that our behavior is changing rapidly day by day languages regions are segregating us it's as real as inconceivable like those tenets and inventions which we had discovered and devised since our inception as you will find many critics who jeopardize a piece of art over the language and not foresee its grandeur as if your language is an identity and many alone residers talk on speaker phone even in their private room so that their neighbors don't consider them like a maniac even uripides will blush after witnessing all these hence proved that languages regions are influencing us psychologically which results in a chain reaction of changing existence humanity dying and being born and becoming the begetter of the new social order connecting every one of us now let us listen to the conversation happening between mangal and sumatran who were sitting on their respective sofas as before but with new attire in sumatran's home sumatran gravely oh ah so you heard that writer's name in your dream you want to go through all the reasons in detail mangal yeah that guy uttered the name and sumatran see the name you heard might be because of that book you were reading on that night of that accident even that bhajan can be here because someone might have listened to it near you in the hospital when you were asleep according to some of my researcher pals dreams are nothing but thoughts which are generated through the brain by absorbing the background sounds during the sleep period and emulsifying it with the preconceived psyche synchronously and unconsciously if we can count we may find more than 60000 thoughts in a minute 
It's the thought we have in us all the time, which we fulfilled or relinquished due to our conditions in a real life. Like imagine, if you met a widow and you both fell in love, love at first sight, according to your coping mechanism or um, yeah, momentary conditions, you either oppose ritualistic society or you don't. However, in your dreams, you can oppose society and have her in your arms. It's not more than a feel-good therapy, which your brain gives to you and itself. Mangal Yeah, I got it. Consolation prize to carry forward the journey. Sumatran Hmm, hum, kind of. However, when special cases like you appear in front, the secrets lie in childhood, which we dig to know the real cause behind the mishap. Do you remember anything about your childhood? Any incident that had hurt you for a longer period of time? Mangal, slumbers don't. No, I am unable to coerce my mind to remember beyond 11 years, no matter how much I try. can only recall the killing of my puppy by some asshole children. Sometimes I even wonder whether any memory of my childhood is real or just a Mandela effect. Sumatran yawns. Fine by me, with a gap, Mangal looked towards him. Mangal, pardon my French, but what do you mean by fine by me? Ain't it concerning you about anything? Sumatran laughs. <laughs> Oh, don't take it otherwise. I just wanted to say that it's common. Infantile amnesia. Sumatran went towards the nearby sink and cleansed his palms. Mangal peered towards him wide-eyed. Mangal. What? Amnesia? Sumatran chuckles. Hold your horses. It's as common as dirt. Almost every mammal has it. The inability of recalling childhood memories. See, we possess some illusions which are prevalent because of our environment like land sickness. Ah, that feeling of rising and falling. We get effect a long train journey as if we are still on the train, even after hours on to land. Okay, enough for today. I'll try my best to treat you. Hmm. Any attacks yet after that last visit? Sumatran sits back on the sofa while noticing the brittle eyes of Mangal. Sumatran, you want to ask something? Mangal stammers. Uh, I don't know. Mm, just uh, why me? Sumatran sneers at him for a moment, then clapped once to get his attention. Sumatran chuckles. Okay, so um, do you know anything about that writer Aviral? Mangal nodded in no with a puzzled and sad face. Sumatran. He is nobody until he launched his second book. That book, which we have in his first published available work. The country law seized the rest of his works. Mangal, astounded. Why? Wasn't it some The Handmaid's Tale stuff? Sumatran wings. Good guess, but something different. Hmm. He used to left some treasure hunts in the novels and became famous after several of the book fans find it out to be real. Mangal. Ha! Huh. What he gave to them inside that Baal del Tesoro Shiny sequence? Sumatran. No, but same as sequence. There were hundreds, thousands of liquid cash, which he implants in some dead drops for them. He used to call the hunters as Koti liquor, and those dead drops as Kankana Kandara. Mangal. 
That's Sanskrit, right? Sumatran. Mm-hmm. Limbers vade, limbers grande. He writes those treasure trove sonnets in Sanskrit, which anyone has to decode, and Katineshu begin from there. Mangal drinks some water from the bottle placed backside on his sofa and put it back. Mangal gulps. Oh, okay. Sumatran. Few months after the book came out, numerous clobbered airless corpses were found in desolate places in many cities of the country. After many strenuous efforts, the Bureau found every homicide has a link with that book and its treasure hunt. Mangal shocks. Ik, how and why? Sumatran. At that barren dead drop, two people arrived simultaneously at the same time. And in skirmish for money, one killed another. Mishap occurred around numerous like it. Mangal mumbles. Holy Grail, such a jerk genius, if it's all for his choking game of wonders. Sumatran. So, how are you feeling now? Mangal shrugs on the question with confusion. Sumatran, I was just changing your mood. <laughs> See, that's how our brain works. Ever want to change the mood? Do entertain yourself, okay? Meet after a week. Mangal, puzzled. Okay. Mangal went out peering at the night sky and took a walk on the silent road. He collided with a man who was wearing a blue bandana mask and red goggles. The man goes inside Sumatran's house in hurry. Mangal turns forth with a scornful grin and walks forth. Meanwhile, the jeep carrying Jayant and Niketan passed from the front of him, deviating his focus. Ye Kya Hua song of Amar Prem movie is echoing loudly from a vintage pocket radio placed on the dashboard near the windscreen. Two guards were in front seats, humming the song, and one was sitting behind with Jayant and Niketan. Jayant saw Mangal through the rear opening of that jeep, strolling outside, and Mangal saw him for a moment and turned forth, while the jeep wheeled forth rapidly. Jan scorns. Such a hex! Nikitan peered towards him with indolent eyes. Giant whispers to him agitatedly. Jan. Arr! That dick is sheer curse in disguise. From the day he met, my life turned into a fuck load. After some minutes, Jeep halted near the police station. Guards took them inside and indicated them to sit on the floor outside inspector's chamber. Both of them sat down on the ground and started looking around while guards entered inside the inspector's chamber. Suddenly, Nikitan finds out that Anand Bakshi is coming towards him in slow pace with a faint smile. As Anand Bakshi came in his front, they stood up. He looked at Niketan with affection while guards came out of the chamber. One of the guards. Do you know them? Anand nodded in yes while peering towards the indolent face of Niketan. One of the guards gravely both were blowing hookah in Edward Woods. Sir's not here, otherwise they would have spent entire moonlit with punkies in jail. Take care further. God glared at them and left forth. Anand curses Nikitan's face with a faint smile. Anand, husky voice. Son, she never told me about you. You guys were seeing each other, right? As soon as Niketan nodded, 
Anand exhaled deeply and wiped his moist eyes while stroking his arm. Anand, Mamba. From the day she went missing, I didn't report until that day when a corpse was found. Only due to the social and mundane accolades that I had and which was once humiliated after her mother left the house. I regained my honor from society after many years of sacrifices and I didn't want it to lose it again, although I had some old contacts with PD, which were searching her covertly for months. But now, as the coins turned upside down, that, that Caracas you ran away with was some another girl's body. Both glanced at him astonishingly and Nikitan grabbed Anand's wrist firmly. Nikitan fumbled. Is that, is that true, uncle? Tell me, is that true? He held back a few steps with tears of joy rolling down his eyes as soon as Anand acknowledged. Jayanth pats his shoulders with a beam. Jan whispers, Congrats on a new hope. With grief, Anand turns towards the other side and walked forth towards the exit. Nikitan ran near to him. Nikitan chuckled in a sad tone. We'll find her, uncle. I'll find her, don't worry. Anand looked at him with a slumber smile and went away outside. He took out his cycle from an empty cycle stand, sat on it and wheeled it on the roads. Sudden obscure flashbacks occurred in front of Anand's teary eyes, where his young self was scuffling with someone inside a ruin covered with darkness. They were rolling over each other, choking each other's necks, while stumping over the floor. That someone bit the blood out of Anand's neck from its teeth. He groaned in pain while trembling on the floor, and that someone ran away. Panting rapidly, he halts near his apartment building. Wiping his sweat from his forehead, he strolls towards the garage area, carrying the cycle. Mangal comes strolling inside the apartment premises from the outside road. Peeping at Anand, who is approaching towards the garage, he entered inside the hall area. As Mangal approached the stairs, a call from some unknown number came upon his cell. Anand passed aside by him towards the stairs while he picks up the call and went back outside. Mangal. Yeah, hello. Who is this? Someone. Indistinct chattering happening. Commanding voice. A murder has happened. Whose last call has gone to you? Come to PS as soon as possible, okay? Cell cuts abruptly. Mangal quickly opened his cell history and found... Sumatran's number at the top. Mangal whispers, What a fucking man! Horrified, he ran out of the apartment premises towards the road. Panting heavily, he ran as fast as possible, reached inside the police station and collided with Jan while they both fall on the cemented floor. Trembling, Mangal stood up quickly and went inside the police station. Puzzled Nikitan picked up the Jayanth quickly. Jayanth blurs. I'm a fuck him like a mink. Nikitan intervenes. Calm your ass down. We are inside a fucking cop shop. Keep delicate. Come on, move out with me. Jayanth nodded furiously with a deep breath and they went outside. Meanwhile, Mangal goes inside the inspector's chamber. 
Some people were surrounding the table in plain clothes. One of them sneered towards him. Mangal gasped. Sir, I, I got a call about some murder. Constable, penetrating tone. How did you know him? And everything? Write in detail on this paper. If we find any relation of you in this homicide, I'll personally ring your fucking ass down. Understand? Now write. Pushing a paper on Mangal's palm, he went outside the room. With grieved eyes, Mangal took out a black ball pen from the table's drawer. Placing the paper on a table, he starts writing. Suddenly, the ruckus around died and every bulb of that chamber starts flickering. He slowly lifts his eyes and finds that entire police station silent like a cemetery, with no one around. The echo of Robert's footsteps coming from outside is slowly and incessantly moving towards the chamber who is singing the Amazing Grace song. Terrified Mangal clenched the table firmly while trying his best to ignore that voice and closed his eyes while gasping rapidly. <laughs> song stopped with a sinister giggle and there's a heart-wrenching silence for some moments. Gently opening his eyes, Mangal gets horrified, finding the wide-eyed Robert giggling <laughs> beside him, fluttering his blood-soaked hands in the air. Mangal shouted and convulsed. Leaning half from his chair towards the ground, he hanged in between. His bloody fading vision noticed him surrounded by the people and he fainted. Narrator Many of you will think about how it happens. It's an impossible thing. But science has been incessantly solving every deranged enigma of this cosmos we inhabit. Moreover, never underestimate your brain. It can make you feel African summer in the winters of Siberia. A revered psychologist, Sigmund Freud, once woke up and wrote down his dream immediately, in great depth, and it leads to the discovery of a fecund term of modern-day psychology, known as Psychoanalysis. Huh. How many of us do that? You would say that he is a researcher and we are just mammals living for bread. Why would you do that? Ah, I'm not telling you to start writing dreams. I want to convey that stop sleeping while being awake. You can at least focus on the things you do diurnally. Like if you pay attention to your past momentary thought, you will get much detail about your psyche and it will help you much to improve the inside of you. But that thought must not belong to the present because if you pay attention to the present one, it will disappear. Always consider past thoughts. Imprudently, thoughts are driving us and everything happening in the world is related to your thoughts, just you are late to see it. Ah, at times, a person is so lost in his thoughts that he became oblivious around and when it gets severe, a pathological society germinates in between hours. Either dopaminergic or a serotonergic expectations have been ruling us from the beginning till now and will remain so. Ah, see, you too must have seen someone's face on a stone or tree's surface. 
In childhood, we used to draw several imaginary shapes on clouds. Psychologists termed it as pareidolia, from the phi phenomena of a moving picture industry to the beta movement phenomena of moving lights industry, we are constantly living inside a world of illusion. And now this world is genetically implanted within us and we can't do anything about that. Those ghosts who terrorized us, every murder and tenet that were imposed on us only because of someone's inner voices, all originated from here. Oh, enough sermon about psyche. Now let's take our ears on the music which is echoing around Mithil's manor. Sitting on a low height kitchen floor of his dark house, Shaker is eating milk soaked bread. Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head song by B.J. Thomas is playing upon some music player in some room, is echoing in and out around the whole house. Suddenly a giant flying cockroach fell from the top roof in his bowl and started fluttering inside it. Annoying angrily, he threw that bowl on the floor, stood up and punched the near wall. He glares towards that milk-drenched cockroach in rage, which is squaring near the sink floor. Angrily picking it up with its antenna, he severed the head of that cockroach with a knife nearby that sink and threw it in the garden outside the kitchen window. The song on the room changed to Bye Bye Love Song by Everly Brothers. A giant rat came squeaking from the dark part of that garden towards that fluttering torso of that cockroach, then pauses some distance away from it and ran towards the backside of Nikitan's cabin. Sometime later, Shaker went out of the house, hiking forth on the road. After a quarter hour, Seeing toward his wristwatch, Nikitan opened the gate and looked towards a big dangling lock on the doors of the lightless house. Suddenly, the music of Mariner's Revenge song by the Decemberists starts coming out from that house. Nikitan mumbles, Looks like sucker ain't at home. Fucking jerk has left the music on. He strolled towards the garden and whistled the music of that song coming outside of that house. Turning on the flashlight of his cell, he went near to his cabin through a pitch-dark garden and turned on the corridor lights. A giant cockroach helps to straighten the fluttering torso of that decapitated cockroach while the light rays coming from that distant cabin fall on them. They crawl inside the house from a nearby small hole in the outside wall. Meanwhile, opening the door, Nikitan went inside, sat on the front bed and starts taking off his shoes. Suddenly, that knocking sound starts coming from the beneath again and he stopped in anger. After getting up, he went to the corner of the bathroom when he had kept that cake soaked with rat poison before going out. Seeing five carcasses of rats lying there, he laughed hysterically for some moments. Nikitan grins. Bingo! Fuck your motherfuckers! You banged my sleep! I banged your asses out, suckers! <laughs> Suddenly, his eyes fell on their backs, which have something inscribed upon them. Nikitan whispers, Smells like trouble, man. Hmm. Picking up one of them by tail, 
he goes in front of the dim light coming from the bulb and sees that some words were carved on both sides of its back help me under the land rat's body slipped down from his trembling fingers and collapsed on to the ground with sweat nikitin glanced at the floor near the bed from where the gentle uneven thudding sound was echoing in his silent room since his arrival he stops near the ground in front of the bed with slow steps from where that sound is coming frightened nikitin bowed and placed his left ear on the ground he heard indistinct screeching of rats with that uneven thudding he knocked on the ground thrice with his ring finger and that thudding sound increases quickly and incessantly shrinking back he stood up horrified and knocked on the ground thrice with his boots and a moment later that gentle thudding sound also came thrice Nikitan stammers in horror motherfucker fuck this can't be real man this can't be real what am i do now fuck he saw a giant rat escalating from outside the room and ran towards it running away from bushes and dried leaves he lost that rat somewhere in the dark Turning on the flashlight of his cell, he wandered around the yellow oriander trees, which are near the muddy and shady posterior ground of the house. In the muddy soil around, his shoes were sinking a bit, yet he kept inspecting that deep dark place. His flashlight again found that giant rat, a little away from him. escalating beneath the bush next to some rusty and grilled manhole he ran near that manhole which was closely adjacent to the backyard of that house and found a tiny rat perforating the soil chunk beside it which ran away noticing him his attention falls on the sharp low banging sound coming out from the storm drain putting cell on his chest pocket He drags out the hefty grilled cap of that manhole and inspects it inside using the flashlight. A dry and dirty slopping floor was seen inside by him. Jumping inside, he slipped and fell down headlong. Rubbing his eyes in agony, he saw a tarnished wooden half sluice gate swinging on a thick corroded screw. nailed on the top portion of the dry sewer he forcefully kicked the gate several times and it fell away to the sewer floor that banging sound is clearer to grasp by him now while it is coming out sharply from the front there stunned he finds the atmosphere on the other side of the sluice gate was different dim light of many halide bulbs which were equidistantly placed on the walls of the sewer were illuminating the dilapidated floor around sliding carefully he went inside that sewer and stands out with an inclined head after finding some safe foothold as it's not that wide to walk uprightly sloshing sound of flowing water were coming obscurely from some distance with a grimace he expectorates aside as he sniffs a horrendous stink of waste water bespattered around that dry sewer then focused itself towards those sounds and strolls forth carefully that giant rat ran from his behind towards forth and entered inside a rectangular cemented manhole from a hole in its cap which is just a short distance away from nikitan with bowed head he ran near to that manhole nikitan noticed that just two steps away from that manhole sloping is a deep as a dark trench and a slushing sound of flowing water 
were coming up from down there. Turning towards that manhole, he kneeled and gazed inside from a broken corner of the cemented cover. He saw some rope-tied and dusty legs of girls lying quiescent on the feeble lighted floor. And on the other side, two girls' rope-tied wrists were punching over a hefty broken steel door which was dangling proximate to the wall. He heard the whimpering of some girls, but their faces were not visible from that small hole. Nikitan whispers in horror, Good God Almighty! What the fucking fuck is this? Blessing himself, he turns back and wanders upwards in search of something. He finds a small, hefty and rusted iron rod which was lying aside. Picking it up, he ran towards that manhole with an inclined head. Putting that rod in that broken portion, he put all his strength and plucked out that cemented cap. Throwing the cap aside, he peeps inside and suddenly got kicked by someone from behind. Losing balance, he fell headlong on the legs of those girls. His neck and torso get bluntly hit with the floor and bleeding starts from his elbows and back of the bandaged head. Groaning, he turns upright and finds the headless torso of four girls tied together, whose legs were under his trembling palms. Those dead bodies were heavily infested with maggots and beetles. Numerous rats were squeaking and running around from a big stinky hole in the wall behind that broken steel door. Crawling back some distance from those rotten stinky carcasses in horror, he peered towards two mourning girls who were tied up together in a long steel pole situated in between their legs with rope which is attached with that manhole. Their forehead were tied together aside from the pole with some plastic bandages so tightly that their lips were penetrated into each other due to which they were unable to speak or see anything. Shekhar screams aloud. I fuck the fuck birds. Who fuck premarital? A rope ladder rolls down from up and touched the floor. Those girls stopped banging that steel door and started moaning hysterically while clamoring their adjacent rope clenched feet on the ground. And one of them started peeing on the floor in terror. Gasping heavily, Nikitan sees Shaker coming down, who has a broad axe in his hand, tainted with dried blood states. Shaker angrily, Suck my butt, cunts! Arn, hush down your whimpering tots! Enraged, he went near the girls and kicked them on their waist several times. They fainted in pain as blood starts flowing from their lips. He slammed his feet on the floor and went towards Nikitan furiously. From the pointy corner of broad axe, he hit Nikitan's forehead and booted his chest several times. Nikitan fell on the infested ground, groaning in pain, and his white bandaged head turns red with blood. Shaker and rage. Motherfucker! Die, motherfucker! Die, you fucking junko! I have told you to mind your own fucking business. Now I have to slay your cunt. That's what you deserve, motherfucker! Groaning in pain, Nikitan rides around the decollated corpse of a girl and lay static on the ground while clearing towards Shaker. Nikitan groans in breathy tone. I will slay your crooky ass, motherfucker! Oh, 
can't head. Cock sucker. Oh God. Oh. Ah. Oh. You just wait, you fucking ass licker. Shaker sits on a rusty paint drum near him, stating the axe on the wall. He starts a rasping his knuckles. Shaker, stringently. Stop chanting, motherfucker. You have dug your fucking grave by thyself. Quagmire is that. I have to light the pyre of your asshole Akin, as no male left in his life after you. Nikitan, enraged shrill. Motherfucking asshole! Ah! Infuritingly, Nikitan tries to get up, but Shaker kicks him on the chest vigorously by his boots and he falls back onto the ground in agony. Shaker scoffs. My pop used to say, Be brave like a crab and shrewd like a cuckoo. This fucking world is like an island of predators. So, rip off anything which comes in your way. You see those lesbos out there? Pointing towards those two girls. They came in my way and I glued their twat liquor mouths together. Now they can snog each other for eternity. Nikitan stares at him with disgust and spits aside. Shaker scoff. What? Are you Earl's consort, ass liquor? Your pig fucker dada and I have served numerous from their lives. We are as thick as thieves in crime and, obnoxiously, your blood is a muddy as mine, motherfucker. So save your pussy tears for death angels. Nikitan scornfully, I have seen enough psychos, but not a fucking sucker like you. Do you even hear yourself, huh? Why you even done all this? Enraged Shaker stands out holding that broad axe and blew on Nikitan's forehead with his stuff. With a momentary blackout, Nikitan fell to the floor, blinking the blur around him. Shaker violently hits him on the torso several times. Shaker, enraged tone. You wanna mess with me? I'ma fuck your wanky ass up, cocksucker! As he raised the axe in fury to kill Nikitan, a large lump of dry clay fell from the top on his back and he faints away in agony. Jayant slides down slowly on the ground from the rope ladder and goes towards the shuddering body of Nikitan, who is moaning while turning back and forth. He was horrified to see those stinky dead bodies for a moment. Then his eyes stall on those two girls, entangled together on a pole, who just came to their senses and start groaning in pain. Niketan's cell, which had a giant's name on its call screen, and which was lying near Niketan's knee, collided with a giant's shoe and entered in between the two legs of a girl's dead body. Inside the dirty and infested shirt, as soon as Jayant took him on his shoulder and starts climbing up the rope ladder. Coming out of the manhole, Jayant puts the insensitive Nikitan's shredding body on the sewer wall and goes back inside. After venturing inside, he slowly crossed Shaker's unconscious body and reached near those girls. Looking at them with great sorrow, he stroked them tenderly they began to screech and tremble at his touch. So he goes near to their ears and whispered, It's over, gals. Calm down. Let me help you. Ring of Fire Song by Johnny Cash starts playing and some music player inside while sparks started coming out of the main circuit board, hanging just after the entry door of the house. Those two cockroaches, headless and the helping one, 
fall down outside from the rotten hole of that wooden main circuit board onto the floor and crawled out of that house from the main door. Behind them, dozens of small and few big ones too came out from that hole of that wooden circuit board and started crawling here and there rapidly. Meanwhile, Shaker abruptly wakes up in agony and drags himself out of that hefty lump. Unable to find those two girls and Nikitan there, he screamed in rage and punched the nearby wall. Shaker, breathy tone, Motherfuckers, I will kill you all! With his trembling hands, he forcefully came out of the manhole limping and sat on the sewer floor while painting. After some moments, he stands up and within a fraction of a second, a gigantic fire blow enters into the sewer from his front. Horrified, he fell backwardly into that dark sloppy side of sewer while outside his home explodes in flame with a boom and gigantic fiery smoke arose and scattered in the sky and around the house. Hearing the explosion, distant neighborhoods and night guards came out and start gathering in front of that house. Chapter 4 Macrocosm Replivin Ozymandias' song by Sammy Copley is playing in narrator's background. Narrator Well, we have now reached the climax of this elongated audio. I hope you have enjoyed the moments so far that you've crossed with me. You know, anything can happen now. Yes, even a tiny thing of today can turn into a hazard in the future. For example, through internet calling, teens that used to prank call people as ghosts for fun evolved now as cyber criminals. In my time, after seeing snowfall in Saudi Arabia and quarantinization of the whole world, I am no longer fixed about anything. Let's see which way the wind blows. Bulla is sitting with one drunkard some steps away from a storm drain near the glimmering bonfire on the roadside arguing over something. Drunkard sluggishly. Fuck you! You're fucking my brain out. It's not Bollywood shit happening around here. Oh, Coolio. They can fucking do anything. Get it? Bulla grunts slowly. Nopes. Drunkard. Bunch of pedophiles. Trina fuck damsels. I mean, wanna dig mines even in 50s. <laughs> Bulla in furious. See, that's why I say don't drink so much that you can't separate your ass from your cock. Fucker, what am I giving and what are you sucking? I am saying that whatever I talk or say, it gets related to anyone who is around me at that moment. Any random shit. Like if I say that from that stinky storm drain, a cockstucker will appear and blow your ass off. It will get real. Drunkard sluggishly. Is that so, dickhead? Bulla and Raid. Yeah, bitch! Bulla stood up furiously. Took up his bicycle, which was lying on the roadside behind him, and rides away from there on it, wobbling 
that drunkard stands and goes near to that storm drain and starts peeing on it. Drunkard, smiling sluggishly. Then, oh, I have some juice for your Pennywise out there. As soon as that drunkard turned back, the voice of Shekhar singing Amazing Grace song started coming from inside the storm drain. Puzzled drunkard turns back to find Shekhar being outside from the grilled cap of that storm drain. Drunkard infuriates in sluggish tone. Fucking tardigrade! Ma, we killed Godzilla's! How do you saved your ass, cunt? Shaker honeyed tone. I will surely elaborate to you over a bottle of beer if you just help me to come out. Drunkard smiles with a burp. Oh, I can even suck your cock for that, asshole. Shaker honey smiled. So just open this fucking lid for me, please. Drunkard burps. Oh, sure, faggot. That drunkard staggered for a bit, then removed its hefty grilled cap and threw it to one side. Before he could manage to turn back, Shaker kicked him from behind and he fell down the roadside. Shaker enraged. Die, motherfucker! I will slay your wanky balls out of your mouth. Die! You wee on me, and I wee on your mother's wormhole, dickhead! Shaker bashed him with boots until that groaning drunkard faints. He then kicked him inside that storm drain, pees inside, and closed the lid back thus tardily. He shouted loudly looking at his mud-soaked and stinky clothes and hands. Shaker shouts in rage, I will burn this entire fucking town! Uh. On turning back, Shaker found Bulla standing behind. Bulla slapped him tight and the two clashed vigorously. While strangling each other, both fell on the roadside and started rolling in the dust. Bulla drained the blood out of his nose in a punch and Shaker violently bites the blood out from his neck. Bulla screamed in pain and some constables came near to them and forcibly separated them. Bulla screeched, Motherfucker! I will tear your trot! In pieces, you scumbag fucklo, fuckless freako, ass leak. Shaker shouts, Come here, you whore clip. I'll fuck you up like a mink, you dick jerk. Leave me, motherfuckers. Narrator Mangal wakes up and finds himself in his old two-room railways quarter where his family used to live during his childhood. Mesmerized, he stands out of the bed and finds the whole place empty. It's cats and dogs out there in daylight. Suddenly, even that bed disappears. He slowly walks some steps and stops after noticing that half bald man coming towards him from behind. Mangal shouts agitatedly, What you want, huh? I'm just fed up with this shitty game. Just tell me what you want. half bald man chuckled while circumventing around Mangal. Only for you, we both are here. You just follow Robert and everything will settle down quiescently. See, there's his standing. Just, just, just. Don't forget to snap if you see things around you fading. Narrator, finger of that 
half bald man standing behind him points towards the front room where wide-eyed Robert stands with his same sinister smile. But there is not a drop of blood on his hand this time. There's a very vague murmur from outside that railway quarter coming in. Robert ran out and Mangal followed him. On coming out, Mangal found himself standing inside a silent classroom where many students and Robert are sitting. Sorrowful Robert is alone on the last bench, looking down. Mangal stares at the outside's hazy and windy weather. All of them were paying great attention towards the teacher who is uttering a proverb. The one who hides the work of the culprit is a greater sinner than the one who commits that crime. Suddenly, everything around began to vanish in a thick fog entering inside the class from the windows. Mangal snaps his fingers and found himself standing outside a tent in a forest area filled with heavy fog. Astonished Robert is hearing some people inside that tent while he is knelt on dew-drenched grass. Mangal heard the voices of people talking about murdering someone and tried to look inside. People inside the tent are going. One, it's moronic. None gonna get a nickel out of this. It's bullshit. Two, what if he is a perfect plan? I don't want to lose this great opportunity. Okay, I'ma help him in killing his brother. You do your pussy cry alone. Narrator. As he looks inside that tent, all of a sudden, that tent disappears in the deep fog and the surroundings around him start vanishing away into the thick, foggy air. He snaps the fingers and finds himself standing near a grey Contessa car in that same forest. But it's a cold, full moon night and the place around him is different. Betsy Bry's sleepwalk song is coming out from that car. He turned around and saw two distant figures dragging someone towards a riverside. His focus deviates by the whimpering of Robert who crossed from his behind and stops near a tree some distance away from him. Mangal turns back to find that Contessa is nowhere near him. But that music is still coming from somewhere and turned forth hearing the loud screeching of forest eagle owl coming from that riverside tree. Suddenly, the howling of jackals starts echoing around. Mangal glares towards the third one who took a big stone from the riverside and smashed the face of that grumbling person which was fluttering on the grass and he dies. Robert screamed and attracted the attention of those culprits towards him. Two of them ran towards Robert who flees the scene with heavy breaths and hid inside a big pothole behind some bushes. As he approaches towards that pothole, someone throws a big rock inside it and Robert's screech reverberated around. Everything around Mangal started shaking before he could see that hitter. Everything around starts going inside a gigantic volcano which starts upsurging violently some steps ahead of him. Mangal fell down on that shaking grassy ground. A giant sal tree nearly starts falling towards him. He snaps the fingers and found himself again inside the second lightless room of his railway quarter. There is a door in front of which some voices are coming from outside. With his ears to the door, 
Mangal pays attention to the outside talks. Woman 1 crying and shouting. Enough now it's out of tolerance being on inspector's car. That's insane. Tomorrow his men will come and make a spectacle here. His soul is enchanted under a witch spell for sure. That doctor is just looting us with that sleepwalk shit. Don't you see that? You need to send him away or I will go away from this house, period. Man one. All right, sugar. I'll do something about that asshole. Don't cry. Come in my arms. Everything's gonna be fine. Narrator. Suddenly, the sound of sobbing caught Mangal's attention. He strolls towards the front dinghy room slowly and saw light rays coming from the street light inside the room while passing the window curtains, which were flying slowly by the wind. A wind chime is jingling, which was hanged upon on the rooftop, producing some soft tones. Just below it, a giant mirror is hanging on the wall. Mangal went near that mirror and saw Robert crying on it. He felt as if someone is standing next to him. Mangal turned and found his ten-year-old self standing there with blood-soaked hands, looking in the mirror with his teary cheeks. Startled, he peeped into the mirror and saw Robert <laughs> smiling sinisterly. Sound of fingers snapping echo. Gasping loudly, Mangal came to his senses and found himself lying on a wide iron bench in the police station's veranda. A constable was sitting in his front on a wooden chair. Confused, Mangal strokes his bandaged forehead and groans a bit while sitting upright. Constable, need water or... Mangal groans. No, sir, thanks. Can I go now? Constable. Hmm. Go by writing the number and address on this slip. You just scared the shit out of us today. He handed him a paper. Mangal left the police station hiking after writing down his contact details. Walking a bit, he stops near a grocery store which was nearby that police station around a desolate corner. Mangal. Cola. The storekeeper nodded and went inside. Suddenly, the news coming on a TV placed on a table inside the store caught his attention. News anchor. Headless corpses of four girls were recovered by the police from a basement inside a closed sewer. Half of the house badly burned to ashes. As you see, there he used to keep his victims. Two rescued girls, currently admitted to Churusal Hospital in critical condition, can prove to be important witnesses. Talk of the moment is that when city law doesn't allow anyone to extend property on a public sewer, how he successfully managed to live there illicitly, and why did no one notice this property for so many years? Municipal authorities owe a duty and obligation to see that the residential area doesn't get spoiled by unauthorized construction. The shopkeeper distracts his attention by placing the cola bottle on the front desk. Shopkeeper scoffs. You can't count anyone these days. Gradually, this city is heading into elephant's ass. Mangal goes out and sat on a cemented bench which was some distance away from that store under a huge tamarind tree. He looked at the TV while drinking the cola. Seeing a shaker's picture on that TV screen, Mangal became a bit numb for a few moments and that cola bottle slipped down on the ground from his palm. Some memories began to flash in front of his eyes consecutively. First flash. 
He is ten years old, sitting on a thick branch of a mango tree, sucking mango, while watching his father hugging a shaker and going with him inside their old railway quarters. Second flash. In a foggy day, a lot of obscure chattering is happening all around and some boys and girls were practicing amazing grace song while sitting some distance away from Mangal on the grassy ground. He is in school sitting under a banyan tree while staring at a boy who is sitting alone on the last side of the school's playground, far from Mangal. That boy stands out abruptly and ran towards the school building. It was Robert. Third flash. Mangal, aged 10, stares at Robert, who is whimpering, standing outside with bowed head through a glass window of the class near his desk and furiously glared towards science teacher. Fourth flash. Ten-year-old Mangal was peeping outside from a little open part of the door of his dark room, hiding from his parents with sad eyes. Some of his neighbors were showing some CCTV footage of last week to his parents. In a footage, Mangal, while sleepwalking, freed a neighbor's rope-tied cow away and stared at the CCTV with a sinister smile and icy wide eyes and hiked forth. In the next footage, he flew a parrot which was inside a cage hanging outside a neighbor's house by opening it and while strolling ahead, he stares at his CCTV with that same sinister expression weeping quietly. He sits near the door, staring towards the window, from which street light is entering inside the room, passing the swaying curtains. He bowed his head on his knees and listens to the voices coming from outside. One neighbor's enraged voice, Take care of your child, Srivastavji. Otherwise, it will not take us long to fuck your ass. We will bear it even then, but you have to answer that cockstar inspector. Let's go. Fifth flash. Mangal, age 10, looked around. The whole class is resonating with conversation of children around. He turned towards his benchmate, who is playing a tic-tac-toe game on a notebook with the front bench boy, Mangal. Have you seen Robert today? Benchmate. I probably haven't seen him this whole week. Puzzled Mangal looked down for a second towards the floor, then took out his notebook from his school bag and starts writing. Where are you, Robert? Sweat-soaked, Mangal returned to the present moment. He stands out of that bench in panic while peering around that rugged market and ran towards his home street. He abruptly entered his flat, gasping, and goes into his room. Chidag, hearing the sound of running, came out of the kitchen and entered the room behind him. Astonished, he saw Mangal knelt on the floor throwing several inside stuff and clothes out on the ground from an opened old trunk which was under his bed near desktop table. Chirag stunned. What the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you messing with them, bro? Come on, man. Stop jerking off. Mangal paused and he found one old picture album inside that trunk. Wiping out a sweat from his forehead, he rapidly turns several pocket pages and stopped at a picture containing his sixth class group picture. Seeing sad Robert in it, the picture slips down his palm and he starts wailing loudly. Chirag sat near him quickly, 
and hugged him while stroking his bandaged head. Chirag softly. Hey, whatever happened out there? Fuck it. It's okay, bro. Mangal composed himself and abruptly went towards the kitchen. He picks up one shovel, which was placed at the corner under the sink. As he turns back, Chirag was standing behind him with an astounded face. Mangal grieved. I'll be back soon. With an intense face, Mangal left his flat. After about half an hour, he came out of an auto rickshaw in front of an old park, holding that shovel in hand while that auto wheeled forward. Strolling slowly, he came near to the half-broken wooden entry gate, which is dangling towards the ground, and looked over a tarnished billboard with a name inscribed on it, Edward Forest Park. On the other hand, Shaker is blabbering softly while sitting on the unkept floor in the red light of the investigation room. A constable brings a chair and places it just a few inches away from his legs. Shaker stares at the young inspector coming from the front, who is in plain clothes. Inspector sat down on that chair and glares towards him. Four constables were standing just behind him. Young inspector chuckles. Dugga, dugga. What you done, Mittal, sir? Department didn't forget those cowardly 1990 shutdowns by you even now. Poor fellas. How many people were killed by this asshole? Hmm? Four Muslims maybe and eight bearded Hindus. Hey! In that infamous Ram's name riots, right, asshole? What? Tongue slipped in your butt. <laughs> Shaker, enraged. Don't you dare talk with me like that, cunt! The inspector kicked him on neck, and Shaker fell to one side of that stinking floor, spitting blood on the nearby wall. He sits back straight, while shrugging and stroking his neck. Young inspector, grave and enraged tone. Motherfucker, it's a police station, not your mama's cat house, cockhead. The older you taught, the lesser you fucked, asshole. Shaker scoffs. What to expect from a pimp like you? This fucking cop shop is a shield behind your faggy barking ass. Young inspector laughs. <laughs> so be it, sucker. You just open your fucking butt about those murders of four girls by you. Or shall we open it for you? Our means have torn out many thick asses like yours. We can give you that pleasure if you insist. Shaker, why are you asking me? You piece of shit! Where are your earthworms? Who'd been caught by your mules in case of their disappearance? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's for commissioner's dick parts on your sleazy butt, right? Cursing loudly, Inspector booted his wounded face until blood started pouring out from his forehead. He penetrated his shoe forcibly inside Shaker's mouth while constables were tightly grabbing his body. Young Inspector shouts, Die, motherfucker! I will rip off your tiny winner and serve it to my dogs, asshole! Die! Die, motherfucker! Shaker strangulated to him. I will tell you, stop! I will tell you everything! He starts panting and coughing incessantly for some moments as that sweaty inspector took out his shoe from his mouth and constables left him shuddering on the ground. At the same very moment, Mangal is moving on a trail of dark, dusty grass while holding his cell. With a turned-on flashlight, 
The entire park is surrounded by the thick and giant sal tree and covered with darkness. Young inspector, now open up your silky dots, come back. Composing himself, Shaker led his back on the wall and cleared towards them. Shaker, what you know about me? That I fucked some douchebag with my gun? Ha! Ah, what a pity! Do you know the feeling you get after killing them? Yeah, you know. Yet you will deny it. When you use your power on civilians, you too get that same comfort. Young inspector and Ray. Put your fucking sermons inside your ass and get down to the brass tacks, cunt. Shaker angrily. You know what? Fuck yourself, motherfucker. I am heading to that. It's not easy as it seems, asshole. Or you kill me and get nothing. The inspector rubs his forehead vigorously with both hands. Young inspector angrily shouts. Speak, asshole! Shaker groans. Ah, so I know that little glimmering kemi over there could hang me to death. But the thing is, somewhere inside I achieved what I wanted. And young inspector glaring at him in distress whispers. Psycho son of a bitch. Shaker sighs. And I want this shitload to stop. It all started with my younger brother. Brother, my ass, you know? There's a grandeur in everything he does for our pop. Pop used to say everything to him and nothing to me. I just wanted my pop's attention badly. He was angry with me just because he thought that my mama died due to that school trip of mine. Some flashes of memories occurred in front of Shaker's eyes. First flash. He is six years old and peeking at his mother from behind a tree. His smiling mother is calling him, Babu, I will find you, while walking backwardly blindfolded. He saw that his mother reached the end of the wet ground of that high mountain, below which the deep sea was rumbling. He ran in front and shouted loudly, Mama, stop! I am here! As his mother smilingly stepped forward with spread arms, half of that wet ground under her feet sunk beneath into the sea with her. Second flash. Loud music of Gloomy Sunday song by Billy Holiday is playing in some room while sound of shakers, age six, screaming and crying was coming from another room. His father is constantly spanking him with a belt while he is rolling on the floor in pain. His father's foot is on his back, making it difficult for him to move. Shaker. It was like a ritual for him. I didn't know then why he locked me in that room for 15 fucking years and kicked the shit out of me every weekend. Now when I squill the guts out of people, I know about that bliss and his glory increased for me day by day. Third flash. A grey contessa is wheeling on the city road catching everyone's eye from wherever it passes. It moved inside a narrow market street and halts outside the entry gate of an apartment building. Everyone around that place glanced towards him as Raj came out of that car. Raj Mittal saw that old apartment building with a grin, closed the car's front door and entered inside the gate. That apartment building is none other than the place where Mangal lives with his brother now. Shaker. 
Meanwhile, mm, he got killed in a fucking car accident and I got both a job in department and freedom from his calaboos. My pop had given every penny he saved to his dearest Raj, my younger asshole brother. He moved aside with that money and I started living in a rented flat separately. Everything smiles and seen beautifully. I didn't give a fuck about his life for years. But that motherfucker appeared again to fuck my brains out. Shaker, aged 39, is slurping rum with Anand Bakshi, aged 33. Lakhan Barnwal, aged 38. Sunil Yadav, aged 42. And Mithilish Srivastav, aged 35, in a disposable cup. All of them were sitting on the ground and sipping rum on their respective disposable cups, hearing and lip-syncing Gavana Karawala Ai Hariji song by Bharat Sharma Vyas, which was playing on a pocket cassette player, which is placed on a wooden chair. Mithilish, sluggish voice. One day, I'll buy this flat from its owner. You won't even have to pay shit. We will live and drink and bring some damsels and... Ah, fuck him up here. Mithilish slowly fell to the ground and fell asleep snoring. Sunil laughs. Slippy dick as usual. Shaker bro, you made our day. This whole fucking week chopped my ass like an onion. Everyone laughed hysterically. Shaker, you got to know you deserve that, dickhead, for forcing your Bhojpuri song into my ass. Sunil scorned. Hey, what do you know about Bhojpuri, cocksucker? That's why I tell you to marry. Anand laughed. Can't relate more. Sunil spoke. How will you? His little mouse was not capable of digging her giant mine. That's why she eloped. So, you just fuck up. Anand spawns in red. Oh, shithead, don't bring that matter. That bitch fucked the piece out of my house. My little Chahat, in her grief, somehow connected her voice with her departure and stopped speaking. I am constantly squandering around psychologists. But not a fucking change is happening in her. Shake her in furious. Wow, wow, don't fuck my mother here, cuntheads. It's not some group cleat steam ceremony. So don't piss my dick off. Sunil spangs on Shaker's shoulder while Raj enters inside the room with a grin and hugged Shaker from behind. Shaker's eyes filled with blood upon seeing him. Still hiding his anger in a false grin, he kisses Raj's head. Everyone stood up and Raj touched Shaker's feet. Shaker smiled. Hey bro, when did you return from the US? No call, no intimation, suddenly? Raj scoffs. Does one have to take Muhurta to meet his brother? I bought a plot in Churusol. Hmm, a few years ago. Have come to sell it, Sunil. Honey died. How many plots? Raj smiles. Sixty acres. Everyone's eyes filled with manic, yet they kept their false smile in his front. Raj smiles. Sold in just for half a million. Deal completed prior day itself. You would get more than that in US, but it is what it is. I gotta go, bro. We'll meet you next week. Raj touched Shaker's feet and left the flat. Shaker angrily kicks the rum bottle, which was placed on the floor. That bottle clashed with the nearby wall and broke into pieces, while the rum inside it spilled over the floor. Blabbering slowly, Mithilish turns towards the other side of the floor, snoring in a deep sleep. 
Sunil agitates. What are you doing, man? Calm your ass down. A lame old man enters the flat with a grim. Old man. Astonished. Is that Kantesa boy your relative? Baba, what a car! And... Shaker intervened with rage. Shaker infuriated. Fuck off, motherfucker, before I broke your next leg, thought sucker. Sunil goes near to that old man, who starts crying and took him out of that flat. Sunil whispers, Uncle, look at the atmosphere before saying anything. Enraged, Shaker clenched his fist. Shaker angrily, I am fed up with this pussy. This bastard doesn't let me couch in peace. To call my father's fifth, yet his ass didn't rest. I will kill that motherfucker someday. Lakan agitates. Have you gone nuts? He's your own flesh and blood. Sunil walks near to them from the front door. Sunil grunts. So what, asshole? Shaker is right. A wrong coin never changes to a real one. Shaker, tomorrow might be too late. If you want to do it, why not today? Shaker clenched his fists furiously. Shaker enraged and grieved on. Yeah, why not today? I will tear him in pieces. Suddenly, the dialer phone of his house started ringing which was placed on the table aside corner wall upon a wooden stool. Shaker picked up the call. Raj Loton. Hello, bro. It's me, Raj. Shaker. Hmm, Raj. Your friends were there. That's why I didn't talk about the real reason for which I visited you. Shaker, gravely. Tell me now. I am alone. With puzzled eyes, his friends stared at him. Raj stammers. I just wanted to apologize to you. Shaker gravely. For what? Raj, low tone. For everything I did to you. For my indecency. For leaving you alone in your hard times. For many irrevocable deeds. Shaker says with a sinister smile, chuckles, I think we need to discuss it privately with a sip of rum. Raj chuckles. That's a great idea, bro. Your time, your place. Shaker smiles. Sure, I'll inform you soon. Have a good day, bro. Raj smiles emotionally. You too, brother. You too. Call cuts and Shekhar violently throws the receiver on the table in rage. Sunil gravely. Was that Raj? Shekhar, angry and grave voice. When Pigeon wants to fall into the trap itself, what would the hunter do? You cunts have to support me. In turn, each one of you will get 30 lakhs. Lakhan agitatedly. Where will you going to bring that much money? You are immersed in debt yourself. Shaker with a sinister smile. From his death, he has a very hefty endowment insurance policy in the US. I am his sole nominee after Pops. My fucker Pop was gay over him and had done everything only for him. But here... He trusted upon me. Lakhan stares at him with disgrace, while others looked each other with a delighted face. Sunil laughs. <laughs> you are a splendorous motherfucker. Mithilish curiously. But what's the plan? Shaker gravely. First of all, close that motherfucking door. Sunil went and closed the front door. Astonished Robert was hiding outside near the wall next to the front door, eavesdropping on them with a horrified face.
fourth flash. Covered in broad daylight, a park full of sal trees, stained with a canopy of children, hawkers, people and old songs. The Grey Contessa entered inside the park from the wide entry gate. Whole place is crowded. Shaker. That fucking day was the last day of that year. Just like today. Entire park will stay crowded overnight for the feral party. With fuckers and douchebag with their piglets. But there was an area in that park where no one dares to go because people believe that a devil bird lives there who kills everyone that goes to that place. We decided that his last breath will end there. Anand will tranquil him with Valium, which, being a doctor, was a child's play for him. In fact, he was the one who presented that white staff's idea to us. But that plan missed the G-spot because a crumb crusher listened to some things that he shouldn't have to. I saw him from a distance hidden behind Anand's tent. From where Anand and Lakan just came out. I wondered what that bed piddler would uproot of us. Duh! But I was fucking wrong. From a distance, Shaker observes whimpering Robert hiding behind that tent under which Anand and Lakan were arguing. Right on the other side of the tent, which is close to Robert, Mangal is staring at horrified rubber, who is hearing some people inside that tent while he is knelt on dew-drenched grass aside it. Mangal goes towards the other side of the tent on an obscure spot for Shaker. He eavesdropped on people talking about murdering someone and tried to look inside from a hole while they left the tent. Mangal turned and looked around outside. Robert was gone. Fifth flash. Old park is covered with darkness. Obscure music is coming and echoing from a distant place. Anand is scuffling brutally with Raj inside a lightless ruin of an old temple. Anand hits his forehead with a stone and blood starts pouring from it. Raj jumps onto him while grunting loudly and they fell down. They were rolling over each other, strangulating while stumping over the ground. Raj bites the blood out of Anand's neck from its teeth. He kept groaning painfully on that solid slatty floor while Raj kicked him in privates and ran away. Shaker. According to the plan, Anand has to bring him to that ruined temple near a desolate part of that fucking forest on the pretext of meeting us and inject him with that Valium shit. But that shithead Robert told everything to Raj and he got prepared for any worst case scenario. He was my retard neighbor's son. That drunkard used to fuck the balls out that mew. Many a time, I intervened between them. For even a fucker like me, it was cold to beat a denarian like that. You can trust me over this shit. He became a retard kind of child. He didn't talk much to anyone. Sunil Yadav, who used to teach in his school, used to say that the boy is very much quiet. There I connected with that nipper, cause I had faced those cards. But I didn't give that piece of shit any right to destroy my plan. <laughs> Although his big fucker Dada didn't give a fuck about his disappearance. Oh, fuck him. Why am I even... Ugh. Panting heavily, Raj runs towards music coming from his ignited contessa. While Run Rabbit Run Song by... Flanagan and Allen was playing in a vintage radio cassette tape recorder lying on the back seat. Gasping and sobbing, he stuck his shoe in the muddy soil and fell. Panting heavily, he got up again and started running away fast, rapidly entering inside and closing the door. 
he triggered the car and drove Port on that muddy ground. With a fraction of a second, Shaker appears on the posterior part and rammed an injection into his neck. Raj faints down while the car crashed with a huge sal tree. Shaker coughs a bit, clears throat. <coughs> Lakhan, Anand and I together, we disposed of his caracas in a good place. We had to wait seven years so that he can be declared dead legally and we get the insurance money. Meanwhile, from where you guys got that motherfucker denarian witness? Ah, oh, did it change anything for that fucking shooting case? Like a pro, I cleaned that shit as I did to my asshole brother. I had to take VRS due to that ass licker commissioner. But I didn't give a fuck because my pension was inevitable and that money too. <laughs> well, we distributed his money and got separated. I purchased that hefty manor and we all decided to never ever meet each other unless it's necessary. But that thirst for blood drove me crazy for every fucking day of my life. That feeling of breaking his skull into flakes. Ah, I wanted to live that again. Actually shooting those scumbags in riots before killing this motherfucker was um, a kind of practice. Like my mentor Natulal did before killing Gandhia. Practice makes a cocksucker perfect, you know. Anand, Lakan and Shekhar are standing around the less conscious Raj's fluttering body. Shekhar throws the dying stub aside from his fingers, which falls inside a small pothole filled with mud water near that tamarind tree. In the present time, Mangal is standing near that same riverside under the tamarind tree while gasping slowly. With a deep sigh and somber face, he starts digging the muddy land behind the huge trunk of that tree. Suddenly, he peeps at a giant forest eagle owl after hearing its heart-wrenching shriek, which was upon a thick branch of that tamarind and was continuously staring towards him with his sinister wide eyes. Fifth flash continues. Mithilesh stopped digging after hearing that screech of giant forest eagle owl in horror. Mithilesh stammers in horror. That's Ulama! Others laugh hysterically, while Shekhar is still glaring at the fluttering Raj. Anand scoffs. Look at his face. Finish the job, fucker. Ah, Ulama! Mithilish again starts digging with an agitated face. Shaker went and knelt near Raj's trembling face, who was staring at Shaker with his trembling red eyes filled with pain. A drop of tear flows from his left eye and gets mixed with the dewdrops lying on the grass blade near his shaking cheek. Shaker gravely enraged. Motherfucker, where's that money which you plant to people around you? That's my pop's money, cocksucker, which you looted. Now everything returned to its origin. <sighs> now I got what I deserved, and you too can't hold. Shaker spits on Raj's face, stands up, and strolls towards the riverside. He took one big stone from the riverside and smashed the face of that grumbling Raj into blood-drenched flakes, which was fluttering on the grass, and he dies. A thick splatter of blood that spews from his head falls on the shining grass of that flashlight placed on the ground nearby that tree, and half the light emanating from it turns red. 
Raj's eyeballs gorged out of his face and falls near Shaker's blood-drenched muddy shoes, who crushed them inside his left shoe while spitting upon his corpse. Every around exchanged glances in terror, while a scream from some distance echoed around. Everyone turned around to that scream and found a boy running away. Mithilish stammers, ah, I think he saw everything. Shaker commands in rage, Catch that twat and rip it into pieces. At present, Mangal is digging up that place while crying incessantly. Suddenly, flashlight rays fall on him from a distant place. However, he didn't stop. One night guard shouts, Which fucker is fucking its mother there? I'm a come there and fuck you up like a mink. Sap sucker, just wait a sec. Robert turns away on muddy trails around those huge salt trees. After noticing them, whimpering in terror, he hid behind some bushes inside a deep pothole some steps away from that Contessa car, listening to the feet running upon that grassy trail. Terrified, Robert closed his mouth with palms. Suddenly, Mithilish throws a huge stone inside that pothole from up and Robert's screech echoed around. As he turns back with a weary smile, he finds Mangal standing there with wide eyes and a deadpan face staring at Mithilish unblinkingly. Terrified, he runs towards him and looks around while holding Mangal's shoulder. Anand walks towards him from behind and stands in front. Anand gravely. That's your son, right? Is he the one? Mithilish whispered. No, no, can't you see he is sleepwalking? That one is lying there. Anand rubbing his chin gravely. What if he turns up? Mithilish wheezy to him. We can't, okay? He is in a dream state now. <clears throat> Psychologists said that he can't remember a fuck in this state. Being a doctor, you must know these shitty things. Shaker is a psycho. Let me handle it. You just please don't tell them about it, okay? Anand nods with a tense face and went forth stroking his neck. Mithilish slowly turns beside to hold Mangal's arm and slowly walks out of the area. At present, one of the guards reached near Mangal, who is crying while sitting on the grass aside from a half-digged pit, putting his head upon that shaft of the muddy-soaked shovel. That guard turns the flashlight towards that pit and saw two oil-soaked rotten skulls of different sizes lying there, one of which seemed to be that of a denarian. Inside the investigation room, Shaker is looking down towards his swollen knee with an evil grin, while others were looking at him with disgrace. Shaker scoffs lightly. I would give myself a good reason to quench my thirst. I was thriving for it like a motherfucker. And then, one day, I caught that scumbag Lakhan's damsel elder daughter sogging a punk in that chura souls fucking lover's park hiding behind a bush. And I found a motive, a cure for my wound. I saw that Hindutva is in danger due to premarital sex being in place. That lion in me rode to save this country. And it found every girl around guilty as fuck. So a revolt raised in me to do a change. Moreover, 
Like for any big revolution, some scapegoats needed to be fucked. And Nupur became my first scapegoat. Why? Hmm, because she's easy for me. Sixth Flash Strolling somewhere in Lover's Paradise Park, Shaker's eyeball stuck upon Nupur's face. A boy is embracing her in his arms tightly and constantly kissing her over the neck and cheeks area. With closed eyes, she is moaning with that boy, puts his hand inside her shirt while smooching her lips and starts fondling her breast area. Shaker starts rubbing his privates for some moments, then stopped after noticing a couple who were laughing and pointing at him. He went to them angrily, grabbed the boy by the collar and picked him up. Both of them started bleeding with folded hands, leaving the boy holding Nupur's hand and pointing her to be quiet. He took her outside of that park. Both of them sat inside a grey Contessa car and wheeled out of that place. Shaker laughed hoarsely. I have squashed her for many years in every way. Shaker returns to the present moment after that inspector bluntly kicked his jaw by the heels of his shoes. He laughed harder while splurring blood-soaked saliva coming out of his mouth and groans for a bit. Shaker scoffed. I fucking love this, motherfucker, spits blood aside. When you pray for rain, you got to deal with mud too. Belent. So, don't mislead me like that. Listen quietly. For many years, I had wanted someone to listen. Young inspector grunts. Speak, son of a whore. Shaker laughs triumphant. <laughs> Look at you. Okay, calm your tits down, Shaker. Ah, oh, I never tied her inside. However, due to her many tenants, fled from there. But I didn't give a fuck about them. That pleasure which I got from her blowjobs. Ah, money cannot fulfill. Ah, so one day, I got really pissed off when I served her fucking head with an axe. <laughs> I talked with her head and also jerked off in it for many months. Then after finding a new cunt, I brewed it into a curry and served it to those motherfucker street dogs. They fucking loved it like nothing else. And the kind of chain reaction started from there. Well, you motherfuckers can judge me, but you will not look into your tarts. What do you think, huh? Why those fucking slasher psychotic shit became blockbusters? Why a villain with pathological idealism get hooting and criminals become ministers and survive their posts for eternities? Who are those fucking cheerleaders of mayhem? Where do they exist, huh? Why it's easy for guys out there to connect with violence than sanity? Cause they find it in every nook of their existence. Every cunt out there one abyssal and shackles of those tenets forced upon them by generation. No one wanna be a fibble. They are forced to imitate. Everyone has a killer inside. Everyone out there is fucking angry. Angry upon their neighbors, their bosses, upon their fucking law out there. This anger is enough to turn anyone into mania. I'm just savor of their primal instincts. After they hear about me, I will inspire the shit out of them to release their anger. That's what I am. Inspector rubbed his knuckles for some moments then, moving the chair in between the legs of Shaker and going right in front of his mouth. Inspector glared at his eyes in rage. Young Inspector, enraged, grunts gravely. You asshole, you are just a piece of shit. 
Your father must be wandering from hell. Alas, I'd slept that night jerking off instead of fucking. One ass licker would have been less in this beautiful world. Cocksucker! May law fuck your ass like a mink. Cuff his wrists up. Inspector moved out of the room after kicking Shaker on his privates. Groaning loudly, Shaker rolls on the grubby floor while holding his privates in agony. Constables put him forcibly on the ground and handcuffed him. Shaker groans and shouts, Motherfucker, erg! I'll fuck your mother, asshole, cocksucker! With teary eyes, Shaker, after hearing the cherry bombs explosion happening out on road behind that room, recalls the memory of that night where he is standing on that riverside with Anand and Lakhan while watching the fireworks happening in the distant sky. Meanwhile, at the same time, grieved Mangal receives a call while sitting under the tamarind he picks up the call. Someone excited. Bro, happy new year. There is a good news. The form of intershop promotion in induction quota has come out. Meet us tomorrow, okay? Have a great night. Suddenly, Mangal and that night guard stared towards the sky where fireworks started happening by youths from the rooftops of a house which was on the city land across the river. After burning, one of the fireworks fell from the sky on the roof of the window of a hospital room located a little away from that house. Inside that room, Nikitan is lying on a bed whose body is bandaged in many places and a glucose drip inserted in his right hand. He woke up panicked due to the sound of fireworks and cherry bombs happening outside. Turning around, he found no one else except Jayant in that room. Sitting in front of his bed, Jayant laughed and kissed his hand. Nikitan puzzles. Ah, oh, holy mighty clit. Jayant smiles with a brittle face. Relax, many tremors await you, fucker. Nikitan smiles with teary eyes. Here my ass is burning and you were joking me. Jan scoffs lightly. Man, that's gross. County allots you a special room to jerk off and your ass is burning. Jackass, just wait a sec. Standing up, Jan went out of the room. Astonished Nikitan sits upon the bed after seeing bespectacled Chahat coming into the room from that front door. Chahat came and sat on the wooden white stool placed near that bed. With wet eyes, Nikitan touched her face and she starts crying. Both of them hugged and wept incessantly for some moments. Nikitan sobs. Where were you, my lover? Kissed her forehead and again embraced her. I had lost my mind. At that time, it seemed to me that you were in them and I lost the sense to even live. Sobs. I was a bit crazy to leave you alone that night. How are you, honey? Chahat. Husky, low voice sobs. How are you, love? On hearing her voice, Nikitan slides back on his bed while rubbing his head in shock. He stared at her with tense eyes. Nikitan, stunned, stammered. Wait, what? Is it real or have I really lost it? Chahat husky tone smiles. I explain to you, it all lies inside a painful memory of my childhood. I didn't remember that exact age. However, that scar had followed me for years.
she delves into some old memories. First flash. Little Chahat is playing with her toys. The voice of her parents fighting started coming from adjacent room. Thrilled with fear, she ran out of her room and finds her mother laying on the floor while weeping hysterically. Her father slams out of the house from the front door. Scared, she took light steps and goes closer to her mother. Blood was coming out of her mother's nose. Chahat sat in front of her and quietly watched her with tearful eyes. Chahat brittle voice. Mama, what happened? The mother did not answer. She incessantly cried for several moments, then sat upright and gestured Chahat to come near her. She slowly approached her mother and hugged her while weeping. Second Flash The grieved little Chahat is standing near Lord Ganesha's statue with folded hands. Chahat A few days after that, my mother left that house and I lost everything. Even I told God, that unless you return my mama, I would not talk to you or anyone in this world. Third Flash Shahat is crying incessantly while embracing her mother tightly. Both of them are sitting inside a bus stand. Everything around is drenched with heavy rain and darkness. Dark clouds thunder in the sky as it was cats and dogs out there. Chah. When I landed that night, it suddenly started raining, so I stopped at the bus stand. Shortly afterwards, a Sierra came and stopped. Opening the mirror of its window, its driver asked me the way to C2 Lane. That was my mama going to meet me in my flat. <laughs> At that time, I shouted loudly after years. My mama was in front of me. I cried and cried. Didn't even recall now how much. She told me that she was fed up with my father's skirt-cheesing attitude and separated from him legally. But due to her lack of resources, my custody was received by my father. Father just lied to me, never told me the truth. Now, as my mother is the CEO of a manufacturing garment company, she has enough resources and power to take care of my needs. She decided to settle this matter with him and that's why she came. But without telling him, she took me with her. She even sent a message by someone to our neighbor, informing him that I am safe and will come soon. There was a bit of mess because that person, who she gave the duty, sent that message to the wrong neighbor. Chahat came out of her memories. Taking off her glasses, she wiped out tears from her eyes and looks at the scowling face of Nikitan, who is sitting on the bed with folded arms. Chahat, brittle tone. I know you are angry. But what would I do? I didn't even came with my phone that day, remember? And I don't even remembered your number. But I promise you, this is not going to happen again. Nikitan scorns. So how come suddenly? That to hear? Chahat holding his palm, brittle voice. Don't say that. I got to know everything from TV news. I told everything to Mama and... 
Niketan Sambarais. You should have come only after my death, so maybe. Putting a finger on his lips, she hugs him while crying. Niketan kissed her forehead and caressed her hair while he saw Jan standing behind, staring at them tenderly. Suddenly, someone puts a hand on Jan's shoulder. When he turned back, an attendant was standing behind. The attendant gestures him for money with a shrewd smile. With a grimace, Jan scrabbles in his jeans pocket and gave him a hundred rupee note. Outside, a news anchor and a psychologist are talking on a giant TV screen which was hanging on the roof wall of the hall of that hospital. Psychologist Scott. Hey, hey, even psychos love romantic songs. Hmm, actually, they brilliantly perform different emotions in their life. They train themselves to at least imitate a humane side to us. <clears throat> it all starts from their childhood. I mean, many of those notorious psychopaths like Ted Bundy or Coed Killer all had this common ground, a very bad relationship with parents, killing animals or a 29-year-old boy with a paralyzed body is sitting in a wheelchair. He is staring at the TV like others in that hall. That attendant came towards him with a grin and start wheeling his wheelchair forth. Suddenly, as soon as Shaker's face came on the screen, that boy's eyes filled with rage. His eyes started trembling rapidly, jumping down on the hall's floor from his wheelchair. He started growling out loud. Everyone around him came near to control his body. Fidgeting on the ground while crying, he faints in agony. Narrator And Robert awoke. After a year or so, Mangal, Chahat, Niketan, Jain and that young inspector are all sitting on a round table together in the Crayons restaurant. Everyone is talking to each other happily. Mangal recalls an old memory when he was 10 years old. He is standing inside the boarding school premises with his father, with a bowed head. Mithilish is kissing his hair while staring at him tenderly with wet eyes. Mithilish, my son, I can be a bad father for you that I suddenly separated you from your school like this. But one day will come when you will find out that whatever I and your mummy did, did for your good. Don't ever worry. Always have in mind that everything happens for a reason in this world. Mangal returned to the present, where he saw the smiling faces of his friends and looked upwards with a grin. Narrator sighs deeply. Constant court trips made them friends. But you people stay away from court or better call Saul if you ever had to. Well, Mangal got a promotion as a helper in induction quota and now works inside the old locomotive factory of this city. Jayanth received a government job as an award on behalf of the MLA 
for his bravery. He is a peon now in that same PWD where Mangal used to work and those lovebirds are together now as it happens sometimes in small towns. Senorita, everything happens for a reason cause in a way. Everything is connected. You are connected with a tiny tardigrade and it's connected with you. Chaos Theory by Edward Lorenz could elaborate this ungraspable tenet proportionately. If I were an occultist, I would have said to Tonikatan that because some of those girls' flesh was in those rats and insects, they helped Nikitan and took revenge from Shaker. On the other hand, if I were a paranormal hunter, I would tell Mangal that Robert's soul started this game through Mangal because while running into that pit, Robert had seen Mangal standing near the car. However, in reality, it's completely scientific. Only if you can just see through those past events. Like after all, why did Mangal go particularly to work in that office? Maybe to inform Jayant about that emblem. However, it could have been anyone. And whatever happened next seems to be connected to it. Well, you must be thinking of who am I? I can be any of those four boys who are sitting at the table together. Because now all of them know the story from its core as they are mates now. According to me, I am just a seeker. Still, I can't contemplate that who the fuck called Nikitan over his cell at that bus stand. The narrator turned off the recording machine, which was kept near him on a table, and goes near the washing machine. After washing his eyes, the narrator turns back and saw that half bald man standing behind him, smiling while waving his hand. Half bald man laughs. <laughs>, 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 <laughs>